I'm Arnold Strickler working with a special task force, nestled in the heart of a dense forest, somewhere in Oregon. The location, a hidden camp serving as our base of operations, was surrounded by lush greenery and towering ancient trees. Our team specialized in hunting and tracking down monstrous creatures that most people believe didn't exist or belonged only in stories. During one of our secret missions, something felt amidst the forest sounds seemed far more subdued than usual. We were investigating reports of missing persons from nearby settlements. Often cracking jokes to maintain morale among the team members, I'd share tidbits about my youth back in Texas to help them relate to me. Today, as we ventured further towards our target site, our team leader Marlena Pruitt held up her hand and signaled to halt. We gathered in a circle, and she whispered her plan. She told us to split up, yes, like in those cliché horror movies, but it was the most logical way of covering a larger area. Marlena went east with Alphonse Bernal, while Jeb Sloten and I were to cover the west quarters with guns at the ready. Nothing could have prepared me for what we encountered as we slowly made our way towards an abandoned cottage deep within the woods. The front door had been violently bashed open, and claw marks decorated the walls inside. From room to room, there were gruesome sights. Bloody handprints trailing across the floor like fingers scraping for survival and discarded clothes shredded beyond recognition. A gut-churning stench filled our nostrils as we navigated in silence. As Jeb checked another room, I found myself at a chilling scene, an improvised dinner table set for two with human remains draped over it like grotesque ornaments a spine carefully disassembled into vertebrae used for cups while knuckles served as utensils. Suddenly, Jeb whispered through shocked breaths that he'd found a barely conscious man, beaten and bruised, with something lodged in his throat. Before I had time to process what was happening, we heard rustling amidst the trees. Although apprehensive at first, I tried to play it off with a strange smile. Hey, it could be just a lost squirrel, I muttered, attempting to maintain composure. Jeb glanced at me with raised eyebrows but continued towing the injured man. The noises from the woods grew louder and more frenetic. Within seconds, the crashing of brush gave way as a creature lunged towards us. Standing on two legs with leathery skin stretched tight over sinewy muscles, its sickly yellow eyes bore into our souls. This thing neither growled nor snarled. Its silent menace was beyond words. Blinded by fear and adrenaline, we barely managed to exchange fire while dodging away from this monstrous predator whose sole intent was to end our lives. Jeb stayed back to cover us when his gun jammed. Frantically using his last bit of strength to ensure that the man and I reached safety, Jeb hollered for me to run as he desperately wrestled the creature down before finally succumbing to its aggressive attacks. Panicking, I sprinted through the moonlit forest, dragging the battered and barely conscious man behind me. I could still hear Jeb fighting for his life, but I focused on putting as much distance between us and that terrifying creature as possible. My breath came in sharp gasps, feeling the weight of the man's body becoming heavier with every step. Neither of us were in any condition to face the abhorrent beast that had made our investigation its hunting grounds. Arriving at our vehicle, I fumbled frantically for the keys in my pocket and unlocked the doors. Please stay with me. I pleaded to the injured man as I placed him in the back seat. The distant sounds of Jeb's struggle tormented me, but there was no time I had to prioritize saving our lives first. I tried calling for help on my phone, but there was no signal amidst these dense woods. Feeling a potent blend of guilt and sorrow for Jeb's loss, I clutched the steering wheel tighter whilst driving towards civilization with haste. With every turn taken, my mind replayed Jeb wrestling that leathery-skinned creature its sinewy muscles flexing beneath taut skin. 
Its hauntingly yellow, silent eyes burned into my memory as a stark reminder of just how vulnerable we were in this merciless world. Upon reaching the nearby town's hospital, doctors and nurses immediately tended to him while I contacted local police. When they arrived and questioned me about what took place in that dilapidated house, it was evident that none of them believed my account about any otherworldly creature. They did, however, take note of Jeb's disappearance when inspecting the gruesome scene with a search party. Finding evidence only of our fired weapons and Jeb's broken flashlight gave rise to conspiracies regarding his whereabouts. Three harrowing days passed before authorities found Jeb's mutilated remains. The heart-wrenching reality of his loss struck me, and I wondered if things would have been different if we had realized the gravity of the situation earlier. While visiting the grieving family in their mourning period, I recognized the undeniable truth. Jeb died putting his life on the line to ensure that the injured man and I made it to safety. Though we could never truly understand what we had faced in those woods, Jeb would always be remembered as a true hero. That creature has disappeared to an unknown location, leaving only chilling memories and questions too terrifying to ask. I thank Jeb's family for sharing their strength during this unimaginable loss, while my resolve pushed me to find help for those it tormented. Though I didn't know much about folklore or paranormal phenomena, I swore to research this creature to protect others from falling prey to its malice vowing never again to let anyone face this horror alone. So began my search for knowledge to comprehend and hopefully put an end to this monstrous being's ominous existence, fueled by a need not only for justice but also for redemption. Whether or not theories formed were met with skepticism, my goal remained true, uncovering the secrets behind this enigmatic entity before more lives were tragically lost. And so, with the fallen beside me in spirit, I ventured forth into a daunting world of darkness and unexplained mysteries. I, Jasper Smalding, was exhausted after a long day at the office. The small city of Little Root, nestled deep in Redwood National Park, had become a hotbed for unusual incidents lately ever since I joined Task Force Valkyrie. We specialize in hunting and tracking monsters, but nothing could have prepared me for what was about to unfold. My partner Alice River and I were called to investigate a peculiar case involving a sudden increase of disappearances in the surrounding forest area. The sheriff informed us that in the past six months, over a dozen people had gone missing without a trace. It appeared as if they had simply vanished into thin air. We started by interviewing friends and relatives of the victims, trying to find any common link or anything at all that could provide us a clue. It began as any typical investigation would. We searched for patterns and discussed potential theories around town, but something stood out throughout our work there was an eerie sense that we were being watched. It started with subtle signs, an unexpected creak from an old floorboard, a rustle of leaves just beyond our view, arresting our attention. As mundane as the sensation felt at first, it gradually increased over time. Our encounters with this stalking presence intensified consistently in line with the progress we were making on our case. One day, while examining tracks near one of the missing persons' homes, we discovered something unusual, large footprints inconsistent with anything known to be native to the area. Alice pulled out her camera to take pictures while I measured the size of these mysterious tracks. The prints were slightly different from each other but shared similar characteristics. Elongated toes and elongated foot pads tapered towards the heel like that of no creature we'd encountered before in our careers. A few days later, after many jumbled thoughts and sleepless hours spent researching possible explanations for these strange markings, 
we stumbled upon a centuries-old folktale passed down through generations. This local legend told of a creature that would appear in times of strife, stealing away people to satisfy its desire to consume and terrify. The lore, however vague and uncertain, seemed the only plausible explanation for our predicament. From this point forward, we iterated on the only plan available to us, track and confront the beast. Its presence was terrifyingly relentless, and flaming a deepening terror within us as its determination intensified. In following the creature's tracks, we found ourselves approaching a section of the forest notorious for its highly disorienting fog. At first, it seemed innocuous, beautiful even in its commitment to shroud the landscape with an otherworldly veil. But before long, the true nature of this fog became known. It was thick and suffocating like heavy smoke and altered our perceptions in an almost intoxicating way. We can't waste. My voice trailed off as Alice stumbled over something hidden beneath the dense foliage. We decelerated as our vision blurred like wax paper smeared with oil. Our senses failed. Within seconds the oppressive vapor retreated to reveal an unimaginable horror. The twisted form of the beast emerged from its veil mere meters from us, imposing itself between us and our escape. Without thinking, I tried reaching for my radio to call for backup but quickly remembered that our devices were losing signal deeper we ventured into these woods. In this moment, clarity hit me like a gunshot. We were alone at the mercy of this monster. The creature was enormous, at least nine feet tall with sinewy limbs covered in mottled skin that almost resembled ancient tree bark. Its head adorned with tangled knots and haphazard horns upon which heavy chains hung entwined scraping audibly against the skin below. It's come for us! Alice's shout rang into my ears as she struggled to draw her gun. We can't let it take us, Alice! I grabbed Alice's arm, and we bolted in the opposite direction of the creature, keeping our weapons drawn. The fog had dispersed enough for us to navigate through the forest, but not enough to feel entirely safe. My mind raced with questions. What was this creature? How did it come to exist? More urgently, how could we escape and survive? I knew relatively nothing about folklore creatures, only having heard some stories as a child that I dismissed long ago. As we hurried through the trees... Alice looked frantically around for any trace of a trail or landmark. There has to be a way out of here, she panted. We could try climbing a tree and calling for help, I suggested. No, it's too risky. We don't know if this thing can climb, she replied as we continued running. Suddenly, the creature slammed onto the ground right in front of us causing us to skid to a halt. Alice aimed her gun at the creature's head and fired. The bullet hit its mark but seemed to have little impact it roared and charged at us again. We narrowly dodged its attack and kept running deeper into the forest. The chase wore on for what felt like hours when we finally stumbled out of the woods onto a dirt road. Out of breath, I tried my radio again and this time there was a faint response from our team. Help! We're being chased by something! I screamed into the radio as we continued running down the road. As if on cue, the creature emerged from the trees behind us, bearing down on us in full force. But in its haste to catch us, it made a grave mistake. It followed us too far out of its foggy domain. The sun was low in the sky now, but still strong enough to start burning and searing its mottled skin. The creature screeched in pain as it veered off the road into nearby shrubs. It stared at us, breathing heavily, as smoke fumes bellowed off its now blistering and smoking flesh. The sun was having a toxic reaction on the creature, making it weak and unable to follow us any longer. As we looked at it with mixed relief and curiosity, I glimpsed something I hadn't seen before, 
A chain wrapped around one of its horns had a small metal tag attached to it, similar to a dog collar. Etched on the tag were three simple words, Government Biological Experiment. It hit me then and there that this creature might not be mythical after all. It was an abomination created by the human drive for power, a twisted combination of man's arrogance and the ancient forest fury. Realizing we had the upper hand for now, Alice and I cautiously backed away from the creature as it wallowed in agony. When we were far enough away, we bolted down the road until our backup arrived. In my report later, I described the creature thoroughly, including its unusual tag. An investigation was launched into possible illegal government projects deep in the heart of these woods but found no solid leads. The creature's origin remains unknown. Some say it's a mutated local predator that got out of control. Others suspect darker conspiracies involving top-secret genetic research. Personally, I tend not to dwell on its specifics. What truly terrifies me is knowing that beyond our understanding lies an inexhaustible source of horrors waiting to be unleashed upon our world. With every bizarre case like this that comes across my desk, I can't help but think about my lost partner, Alice. Whether she died from injuries sustained during our encounter with that terrible creature or from some other mysterious cause during those final days is a question only she can answer. But every time I walk by her now empty desk or see her name on the roster, I'm reminded of the one lesson this near-death experience taught me. The more we strain against the limits of our knowledge, the more perilous our world becomes. This happened to me a few years back. Seems like forever ago. It was my usual fall camping trip, something I looked forward to all year long. Every autumn, I load up my RV and go deep into the forest to soak in the solitude. It's just me and nature, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. I'm no survivalist, far from it, actually. I grew up a city kid with all the modern conveniences. But there's something about unplugging for a week that really resets me. This year, I took my trip to the heart of the Ozarks, in Arkansas. This place just sings to me. You've got those rolling hills, crystal clear rivers, and enough dense trees to truly get lost in. It's the getting lost part that keeps me coming back. For me, it's an escape from the constant barrage of life, work, social media, just that gnawing sense of always being connected. In the Ozarks, I become nobody. It's perfect. I parked my RV in a spot beside a winding gravel road. This secluded corner always seems to go untouched, which fits my style. On this first day, after setting up camp, I hit the hiking trails found this lovely old path twisting alongside a river, so serene. Didn't see another soul out there the whole day. Got back to camp just before nightfall, cooked dinner over the fire, and crashed out early. Honestly, a pretty ordinary day. The type you crave when you've had too much of the real world. That first night, something just felt off. There were strange noises coming from deeper in the woods. Mostly rustling, branches snapping. Stuff you expect to hear out there, but my gut gave a twinge. It was persistent, this unease. But being overly cautious? I mean, come on. I wrote it off as the wind picking up and decided to turn in. Maybe tomorrow I'd explore and see if anything had been around my campsite. Next morning, I took that planned scouting mission. Nothing. No tracks or signs of any large animals. So, what was my deal the night before? Paranoia? I shrugged it off and decided to enjoy my coffee by the campfire. I settled with a mug and listened to the morning songs of birds. 
I'd only have another few days of this serenity before facing the grind again. That's when I saw it, this thing. A flash of movement way off in the trees. First thought, a big oil buck. We weren't in deer season, but these woods? There are all sorts of critters I rarely see back home. Curiosity peaked. I slowly stepped in that direction. It appeared again, then ducked deeper into the forest. At this point, I know this wasn't normal behavior, definitely not deer-like. But again, Ozarks, who knows what lurks here? This nagging feeling told me to walk away, back to camp, lock myself in that RV until it was time to leave. But you see, I'm a stubborn guy. My name's Elkin, by the way. Elkin Wilder. The sensible part of me screamed for retreat, but I'm always up for a challenge. What was the worst that could happen? That thought alone should have stopped me. Instead, I went deeper. I followed, trying to be stealthy. Branches whipped against my face, twigs cracked under my boots. Then it reappeared, but closer this time. It moved hunched over, almost ape-like but also distinctly human. It vanished as quickly as it came, just a brief glimpse. Something wasn't right. Now there was fear. My breath quickened. Despite the warning bells I followed. Dumb, right? It wasn't curiosity anymore, but this compulsive need to know. Like I had to unravel this. Whatever it was, this couldn't be natural. The Ozarks might be wild, but they weren't a zoo. And that shape, so strange, so out of place. This went on for a while, this game of cat and mouse. My heart pounded a frantic drumbeat, but the determination remained. Every glimpse showed, well, not much. I'd only get a hint of movement, like it was deliberately obscuring itself from full view. Now, let me describe this thing the best I can. First off, it was big. Tall and wide, way bigger than an average man. The way it moved, it had this unsettling fluidity, but rigid too. Almost like it was constantly twitching, adjusting. That shape I first saw, low and crouched, seemed its default. Each time, that feeling of wrongness would sink in even deeper. Not just fear, but an unease like my primal instincts screamed for safety. I'd almost give up, then there it'd be again, just beyond the trees. Luring me in? I kept thinking I'd get an answer. Find out what the hell was going on. I pushed further and further, until that gravel road and my RV were only a distant memory. Then, finally, something I hadn't prepared for. An old trapper's cabin nestled within a clearing. Not that rundown cabin you see in movies. This one looked rough, but lived in. Something told me I wouldn't find friendly neighbors to ask for directions. But the movement, that thing, had disappeared. My legs trembled, not sure if it was exhaustion or terror. This cabin, could there be a connection? Had that figure led me here? Was I losing my mind? That's when it hit me the smells. God, it was foul. Rotting meat, but also something chemical underneath. My stomach lurched. There was that feeling again, an overwhelming sensation of wrong coming from inside that cabin. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. Yet, despite it all, an almost perverse desire pulled me closer. I had to see, had to know. This compulsion battled with every screaming instinct to bolt the opposite way. Mistake. That was the turning point. Because what started as just wrong turned into horrifying. I'm going to spare you the gory details, but what lurked in that cabin was beyond what most folks could even fathom. This ain't a ghost story, no sir. This was raw, visceral evil. It was the figure, standing stock still just within the doorway, bathed in shadow. But something had changed. 
there were others. Twisted, misshapen. I can't even call them human anymore. These things shifted and jerked, yet stayed strangely rigid. Each one different twisted in a unique way, yet sharing this uncanny sameness that froze my blood. And all of them were staring right at me. Then it finally looked. The head of the first figure snapped toward me. There was nothing there where a face should have been. Nothing I could even describe. No way to make sense of it. It let out this, this, keening screech, like rusty nails ripping apart metal. I lost it. Everything after that is a blur of scrambling feet and piercing screams. Mine, I'm sure. Those figures were moving, scrambling. Not gracefully like before, but in a jarring, jerky way. I never knew how fast I could run. Branches slashed at my arms. Mud swallowed my boots. It wasn't enough. That guttural moan grew louder, echoing against the trees. One thing burned through my panic. They were chasing me. The only goal was escape. No destination, just get away. Each ragged gasp burned my lungs. My legs threatened to give out. It wasn't that they were particularly fast, the figures. They staggered in this lurching gait. There was something wrong with the way they moved, yet that didn't make them slow. I remember stumbling onto the gravel road, tears blinding me. My RV! If I could reach it, just a few more yards, maybe I'd have a chance. But that damned keening wail filled my ears. They were closing in. I risked a glance back. They hadn't stopped, hadn't slowed. That same unnatural rigidity seemed to propel them forward. In that panic split second, my foot caught a hidden root. I sprawled hard onto the rough gravel, hands scraping raw. Just before the darkness claimed me, I managed to snatch a final glance, and all those twisted figures were at the edge of the tree line, watching. That stillness again, their unnatural shapes stuck against the foliage. It felt intentional, predatory. They didn't even attempt to attack as I lay there. Something held them back. I don't know how long I was out. Came to daze, the sun starting its descent. Pain bloomed across my entire body, and when I tried to stand, a wave of nausea swept over me. Broken ankle, probably. And there they were, back in the same position. Unmoving. It was as if they never blinked, those empty spaces where faces should be fixated on my position. Night fell, an agonizing stretch of time where survival hinged on pure desperation. It didn't look like they could or would cross out from under the trees. I realized if I crawled, crawled painfully on my belly, toward my RV, the line of sight could break momentarily. It was a sliver of hope, insane as it sounded. And as the sliver remained stubbornly unbroken, I began to believe. They couldn't follow if they couldn't see me. Maybe in those shadows, beneath those trees, something else held them back. With every agonizing twist of my body, that damned moaning chorus never changed in volume. Yet the camper drew closer. Closer, until finally... My outstretched fingers scraped the metal door handle. Somehow, in my fumbling, the door opened. I hauled myself inside, slamming and locking it behind me with barely a second to spare. Even within the safety of the camper, the moaning reverberated. That's when I heard it, clawing. Scratching. It was all over the camper's thin sheet metal. Something pounded frantically against the windows. But with dawn, even the scratching finally ceased. Silence. I didn't move. Didn't check until long after the sun was back in the sky. Finally, my shaking hands grasped the steering wheel. My fractured ankle pulsed in protest, but gritting my teeth, I slammed the RV into gear. 
I barely dared look in the rearview mirror as I left that gravel road behind. Those woods might hold countless unseen horrors, but those figures never chased me again. Years have passed. Still, on particularly silent nights, when the wind whispers through the trees just so, I swear, swear I can hear that low, eerie moaning, that unnatural call. Every time it sends a prickle of ice down my spine. They never caught me. I got lucky. Maybe others haven't. All I know is that whatever dwells in those Ozark woods, it isn't what you'd expect. It's worse. They say ignorance is bliss. Sometimes, curiosity bears a terrible price. I still try to forget the unnatural way they moved, the hollow spaces where their faces should be. It'll haunt me as long as I live. It was an odyssey into the depths of pure fright, an experience that redefined the very notion of terror. For within those shadowy woods, in that isolated realm, the human capacity for unimaginable evil took form. Some monsters lurk in the whispers of legends, Others exist in the harsh light of day. I faced the latter, and it forever changed me. My yearly camping trips never went beyond the local campgrounds after that. I have no explanation for those creatures. Not one that makes any sort of rational sense. Were they failed experiments? Some dark cult's victims? Who knows? But in those moments I felt hunted. Not just stalked, but watched meticulously, like a specimen. It gnaws at me to this day. Did that thing, the first one, deliberately draw me deeper, lead me to the cabin? I reported what I saw. Of course, the police thought I was crazy. I spun some tale of a drug-fueled hallucination, but they didn't fully buy it. The look in their eyes said enough. Maybe a few searched out there deep in the woods. Did they ever find that old cabin? If so, they kept it well hidden. There's no article, no missing person report. Nothing that might explain it all. The official silence tells its own story. Either that, or the figures dealt with anyone who got too close to the truth. This might be my last chance to share this story. They say I have cancer. It's spread pretty badly. Maybe this is a kind of confession, before I go quietly. Or maybe someone with the means, the drive, will read this and decide for themselves. Just remember, sometimes it's better to leave certain mysteries untouched. To walk away while you still can. This happened to me several years ago, when I was driving my beat-up truck through the Appalachian Mountains. I was a thirty-year-old accountant by trade, my name being Gilroy Sanderson. I remember stopping in Serenity Valley, a sleepy little town surrounded by dense woods and rugged terrain. In that town, I met the friendly Dashiell family, Oliver, his wife Lita, and their two teenage children Jonah and Marley. They invited me to dinner since the local motel had shut down recently. We were dining in their cozy house when Oliver mentioned the rumor of cannibalistic mountain men who stalked unwary travelers. All of us chuckled because no one believed in such tales. The next day, Oliver volunteered to lead me on a hike through the mountains as a way to kill some time before I needed to continue my journey. As we trekked further into the wilderness, with Jonah tagging along out of curiosity, we stumbled upon a gruesome scene, a torn open backpack and bloodied clothes scattered on the ground. Oliver suggested going back and reporting the find to the sheriff. But curiosity got the better of us, so we pressed forward despite our growing unease. It wasn't long before we spotted peculiar choreography of footprints in mud boots mixed with bare feet that seemed too large to belong to humans. 
We also noticed bite marks on tree trunks where bark had been stripped away. Intent on uncovering what befell those unfortunate travelers and wanting solid proof about these so-called mountain men before heading back to town, we ventured deeper while keeping our voices down and avoiding injury due to carelessness. The first glimmer of terror struck when Jonah spotted a group of people shambling through the undergrowth ahead. As we hid behind bushes and observed them through binoculars, it became clear these were no ordinary humans, gaunt faces twisted in grotesque malice, fingernails sharpened into claws, teeth filed to dagger points. They seemed to be chanting something incomprehensible while stalking through the woods. Moments later, gunshots rang out, causing us to scramble further away. Oliver dialed 911 on his cell phone, but the call dropped, hinting that we were too far from civilization for cell reception. Believing it was our duty to warn Serenity Valley about these forest stalkers, we tried to make it back home but somehow got lost and disoriented in the dense forest. As darkness fell, we took shelter behind a fallen tree trunk and hoped that the mountain men hadn't caught our scent. Soon after night descended, chilling cries pierced the air, unmistakable sound of torment. Our hearts pounded as sinister laughter echoed through the trees. Fear gnawed at our bones as though it was those mountain men themselves grinding us between their teeth. I whispered a desperate joke about accounting to calm my nerves, but it did nothing to slow my racing heart. Oliver clenched his fists and said he wished he had brought his hunting rifle. No one slept that night as we huddled together in near silence. Without warning, during one dark pocket of deafening stillness, a barely perceptible rustle in the nearby undergrowth froze our breath in abject terror. Before we could make any sense of it, one of those misshapen creatures lunged at us. With reflexes honed by years of soccer coaching, Oliver grabbed a hefty tree branch and swung it full force into the fiend's skull. It crumpled to the ground with an eerie growl that still haunts me today. The swarthy skin and greased hair on its twisted frame confirmed that this man-eater belonged to no known branch of humanity. My mind whirred in horrified conjecture even as my body sprang into action like an attack gazelle suddenly fleeing to safety. Oliver dragged me away from the scene, whispering urgently that we needed to flee before more of those sadistic manhunters found us. But fate had a different plan in store. We were ambushed by more malevolent forest dwellers who seemed to be operating under the influence of a dark presence, their eyes devoid of all humanity. As if driven by inhuman instinct, they descended upon Jonah like ravenous predators, our friend's screams echoing in our ears. In that moment, our chances of survival seemed slim. The agonizing, drawn-out cries of Jonah as the cannibalistic mountain men viciously attacked him would be a brutal, lasting memory. Oliver and I didn't have many options. We couldn't fight them off, and there was no way to call for help. We were deep in the woods with no signal on our phones. As those creatures were busy feasting on Jonah, we took our chance and darted between trees, away from the gruesome scene. It was obvious the only viable option was to escape before they noticed us gone. We ran for what felt like hours through the dense undergrowth, unsure of where our panicked flight was leading us. Eventually, we stumbled upon a small secluded cabin hidden in the woods. In desperation, we entered, hoping it had a phone line or some other means to inform the authorities. Unfortunately, there was no phone or any other modern means of communication. As tired and hopeless as we felt, rest was out of the question too. Every second counted for our survival. There were car keys on a hook by the door, perhaps an escape route if we could find the vehicle. Venturing outside once more, we spotted an old pickup truck shrouded in vines and debris nearby. To our surprise, it started immediately upon inserting the key in the ignition. 
With no time to lose, Oliver drove fast along old dirt roads that led back to civilization. We didn't have any idea where those roads might take us or when we would encounter another living soul willing to help or believe our horrifying ordeal. So, as I clung onto the seat of that beat-up truck, memories of what had taken place kept overwhelming me. The grotesque features of those man-eating monsters occupied every corner of my mind. Their tangled unkempt hair, cruel hunched frames, and blood-stained teeth sent shivers down my spine. Their non-human appearance and beastly behavior were truly terrifying, but it was their eyes that haunted me the most, empty and devoid of any mercy or reason. We drove through the night, narrowly avoiding obstacles and fallen trees blocking our path, unsure of whether those creatures would appear again. As much as we tried not to think about it, we couldn't help but wonder how many victims had been relentlessly hunted down before by those mountain dwellers. Morning arrived with no respite from fear or fatigue. We continued driving until we spotted a ranger station in the distance. We knew this was our only chance to report the atrocities we had witnessed and put an end to this nightmare. Oliver pulled into the small parking lot and approached the station, while I stayed in the truck, too traumatized to move. The park ranger listened intently as Oliver recounted our tale, both Jonah's horrifying demise and our subsequent escape from their clutches. The ranger's face turned pale with a mixture of disbelief and terror as he absorbed the grisly details. He immediately contacted local law enforcement to report the situation. As officers descended on the area to investigate, we knew that the ending of our ordeal wouldn't be able to bring back Jonah or any other lost lives claimed by those creatures. Their memory will forever remain a testament to man's capacity for evil within a desolate wilderness where unspeakable horrors hide behind every tree. It was clear that those monstrous men survived unnoticed by hunting and consuming unsuspecting travelers who happened upon their territory. The enormity of it all weighed heavy on my heart as I realized we could have easily been just another set of unidentified remains found in that forest deep in the mountains. Oliver and I made a pact never to speak of our harrowing experience again, knowing that sharing it would inflict untold pain on others who mourned for their loved ones gone missing in these woods. Today I stand, scarred but alive, with a relentless determination to ensure the story of Jonah and countless others is never forgotten. I will continue fighting to protect those unfortunate enough to stumble into the merciless depths of the woods where sinister beings lurk, driven by their horrific desires. These living nightmares must be stopped, if not for ourselves but for the countless more who might be drawn unwittingly into the unforgiving darkness. This happened to me ten years ago on the outskirts of Duluth, Minnesota. I'm Steve Hodgkiss, a forest worker stationed near the Marshall Wilderness Preserve. As part of my daily routine, I inspected trails and reported any unusual incidents, like fallen trees or damaged signs. At work one morning, I came across evidence of a struggle along a nearby trail. There were broken branches and torn clothing scattered on the ground. The shredded remnants belonged to my colleague, Janice Pembroke. Her absence at our morning meeting had raised eyebrows. While checking the area for signs of Janice, I stumbled upon a bloody knife. Unnerved, I reported the find to my supervisor, Tony Romano. Tony urged me to call the police and guided me through assembling a search party. With local law enforcement on their way, we ventured deeper into the woods. The eeriness grew as each step cast unknown shadows between the trees, yet we pressed forward without a sound. In that eerie silence, our stomachs turned when we discovered what appeared to be human remains partially buried beneath some leaves. 
the police arrived and took over the investigation. During their search, they noticed deep gouges on a number of nearby trees an unsettling sight for everyone involved. Something was seriously wrong in these woods. As days turned into weeks without resolving Janice's disappearance, or arresting any suspects, fear rippled through our community and tensions rose among my fellow forest workers. The uneasy atmosphere at work prompted many discussions about the strange events. I confided in Tony over coffee one day. My wife Lisa isn't sleeping well these nights. She's terrified something might happen to me while working. I said as I sipped my lukewarm drink. Tony shook his head grimly and shared his concerns about his own kids' safety. These kids grow up hearing about what goes bump in the night, he said softly before adding with a sarcastic chuckle. And now we have a real-life boogeyman lurking in our backyard. During one late-night patrol, I came across a mauled deer lying on a path. The sight turned my stomach. The animal's injuries suggested it had been attacked by some large predator. Remembering the gouged trees and the human remains, I couldn't shake the growing realization that there was more to this story than just a simple crime. As local wildlife experts began discussing the possibility of an apex predator stalking our woods, theories circulated, and rumors spread like wildfire. Some argued it was a rogue bear or cougar, while others whispered about unknown creatures emerging from the deep wilderness. One evening, as heavy rain pelted the trees above me, I heard an unnatural growl shattering the rhythmic sound of raindrops. A shiver ran down my spine as I realized I wasn't alone. Grabbing my radio with trembling hands, I tried to call for help but received only static in response. Inching backward cautiously while scanning the area for signs of movement, an unmistakable shape emerged from the darkness an unnaturally tall creature with thick sinewy limbs and dagger-like claws. It snarled as its cold gaze locked onto mine. Heart pounding in my chest, I fumbled for my gun and raised it to fire as droplets danced around us in the downpour. Shots rang out, echoing through the trees before being swallowed by the storm's fury, yet they hardly seemed to phase the monstrous figure that lunged towards me with terrifying speed. I stumbled backward, turning to run as the creature charged. I tore through the underbrush my uniform snagging on thorny branches that scratched and lashed at me. My mind raced with panic, my soul focused on getting as far away from whatever monster was hell-bent on hunting me down. As I barreled through the woods, I could hear the creature crashing after me. Its breath sounded ragged and bestial. The ground beneath me shook with each heavy footfall it made. Adrenaline coursed through my veins as I put all my energy into speed and evasion. At some point, my radio had been ripped from its clip, left somewhere behind in the tangle of plants. Exhaustion began creeping in, but fear refused to let me slow down. The creature never seemed to relent or tire. It doggedly pursued me, closing in with every passing second. Finally, Having no choice but to acknowledge how far removed I was from civilization and help, I desperately changed direction and headed for a nearby river I had discovered earlier during patrol. The roaring water was frigid and moved at an alarming pace. As a last-ditch effort, I jumped in without hesitation, hoping that the currents would carry me away from the danger chasing me. Gasping in shock from the cold, I paddled with all my might until exhaustion finally made it impossible. Waterlogged but alive, I washed up downstream on a muddy bank far away from where I had entered the river. Trembling uncontrollably from both terror and the cold, reality began to seep in. My gun was missing, my radio gone. I was utterly alone. My entire body ached and protested as I pushed myself to stand despite my injuries. My only goal now was to find help and warn others about what lingered in those woods. 
but without any knowledge of my surroundings or whereabouts, it felt like a near-impossible task. Wearily, I stumbled along the river bank, eventually coming across a small boating dock. The place appeared abandoned, but a weathered phone booth nearby provided me with an opportunity to make one phone call. Fumbling with the change I had in my pocket, I dialed the number for the local police station, praying they would believe my bizarre account. When they answered, my voice wavered while I recounted what had transpired and the grisly remains I had stumbled upon. They assured me help was on its way and warned me to stay put until they arrived. As I hung up, a surge of relief washed over me as I knew, at least for now survival was within reach. As long hours passed before sirens sounded in the distance, the images of the creature, its predatory gaze, massive form and vicious claws, haunted me. It seemed almost unbelievable that such a beast could exist undiscovered in modern times. Eventually rescued by the arriving police officers who listened to my story with great skepticism, Life took on some semblance of normalcy after weeks had gone by. But the unknown creature's existence remained an unanswered question that festered deep in our community's collective memory. Despite countless search efforts and investigations into the mysterious attacker, no concrete answers were ever found. The once quiet woods became a location to avoid. Parents warned their children not to venture near it, Whispers of its origin filled every conversation. In time, however, I moved away from that town and from those haunting memories, realizing that some mysteries are left unresolved despite our efforts or desires for closure. For those victims who lost their lives, they became chilling reminders of just how little we understand about the world around us and what may lurk hidden within it. It all began when I, Thomas Abernathy, moved to a small town in Oregon named Briarwood. I needed a fresh start after a messy divorce and decided to open my shop fixing vintage electronics. Everyone in town was friendly and welcoming, but there was something off about the picturesque mountain community. One day, Abraham Pennington visited my shop. He asked if I could repair an antique radio he found in his grandmother's attic. This would usually be a routine task for me, but when I looked at the device, a sense of dread came over me. Over the next few days, strange things started happening. My tools would go missing or end up in bizarre places. Whispers were heard outside my window and the mysterious markings on the radio seemed to grow clearer and more ominous each time I looked at them. Feeling uneasy, I went to see Abigail O'Donnell, a local historian with more knowledge about Briarwood than anyone else could remember. She invited me into her cramped study layered with historical artifacts from the town over generations. When I showed her the radio, Abigail turned pale and told me the dark history of Briarwood, how several hundred years ago, settlers reported terrifying animal attacks with no clear origin. Many members of their tight-knit community disappeared without a trace only to be found dead later with inexplicable injuries. As we sat in her study discussing these ancient legends and unsolved mysteries, Abigail confessed that she believed these horrifying episodes stemmed from an unknown creature residing deep within the surrounding forests, something otherworldly yet undeniably intelligent. Together we delved into research about potential explanations for these disturbing occurrences while strange events continued to unfold around us. A week later, our suspicions were seemingly confirmed when Samuel Higgins stumbled into town covered in bizarre scratches that didn't match any known creature in the region. Amid fearful whispered speculation and growing panic among townspeople, I organized a search party with fellow residents Henry Rutherford and Simon Wellington to venture into the forest and find answers. As we trekked deeper, 
the environment seemed to distort with every step. Trees twisted unnaturally, branches appeared torn off as if by powerful claws, and indescribable tracks marked the muddy ground beneath our feet. All of us felt uneasy, but our determination to restore safety to Briarwood overpowered any doubts. That was until an ungodly screech echoed through the forest, sending chills down our spines. Simon insisted he saw something slither unnaturally around us and rushed off track with a knife in hand. Henry hesitated for a moment before sprinting after him, leaving me alone between the twisted trunks. Terrifying thoughts raced through my mind as I grappled with my fear and the growing realization of what we were facing. What is this horrendous creature haunting Briarwood? How can we hope to stop it without knowing its weaknesses? The sun dipped behind dark clouds as night drew closer, turning the oppressive atmosphere even more treacherous. Suddenly in the distance, I saw movement, a grotesque figure unlike anything on earth with sinister reptilian features crawling through the foliage. I called out desperately for Simon and Henry my voice barely rising above the cacophony of the forest. They didn't respond. Terrified, I decided to make my way back towards the town, hoping to find them on the journey home. As I hurried through the increasingly mutilated environment, the creature followed closely behind. Though I couldn't see it clearly, I could feel its presence, sense its size and weight as it crushed branches under its massive form. Every time I turned around, hoping to catch a glimpse of it, all that remained were the broken remnants of nearby foliage smashed apart by the brutal impact of its movements. I continued my frantic escape from this nightmarish creature. It was clear fighting was not an option, not against this enormous beast, and looking for answers would only lead to a gruesome end. My only hope was to survive and warn others in Briarwood, a sudden rustling caught my attention. I held my breath and braced myself for what might emerge from the twisted underbrush. To my relief, Henry burst onto the path. He glanced around wildly, his face streaked with sweat and fear. Where's Simon? He gasped when he saw me standing there. Fear gripped me as I realized that the silence that engulfed Simon earlier signified a fatal outcome. Before I had a chance to reply or muster any sympathy for our lost friend, however, we heard a guttural growl erupting through the shadows behind us. It sounded far too close for comfort. We have to go! I urged Henry as we broke into a mad sprint, both of us unwilling to look back in case we became paralyzed with terror. What little light remained cast menacing shadows across our surroundings making every leaf and gnarled root seem sinister. Beneath our feet, we could feel the earth shuddering with each monstrous step this creature took in pursuit. With every breathless stride, we kept our focus on the forest's edge. We just needed to reach the town and its people to have any chance of surviving. As we neared Briarwood, the creature's guttural growls grew louder and more vicious, like metal scraping against rock. It was unbearably gruesome, echoing through my core and setting my heart racing. Suddenly, there was a commotion in the distance, dogs barking frantically accompanied by shouts of alarm. We called for help with renewed hope, finally reaching the edge of Briarwood where our pleas were met with wide-eyed stares from bewildered townspeople. Seeing our desperate expressions and hearing our account of this reptilian beast stalking us through the woods confirmed their worst fears, Samuel Higgins' incident was only the beginning. As the events unfolded in Briarwood, it became a struggle for survival for all those who lived there. The villagers banded together to protect one another from this horrific creature that had emerged from deep within the forest. No one knew anything about this monstrous creature. Information on reptilian beings was scarce in our little town, let alone about something resembling an alien species. We didn't bother with folklore, 
No such answers could be found in ancient myth and legend for a creature so alien and terrifying. This enemy was altogether different. Though I bore witness to the beast's violent onslaught from a safe distance, and while I mourned Simon and others like him whose lives were cut short, I vowed never to forget their memory. Drawing on this visceral experience, and terrorized like never before, I dedicated myself to protecting others from suffering the same fate. Together with Henry and remaining townspeople who had survived these disastrous events, we transformed Briarwood into a fortified refuge where no monstrous entity would ever threaten us again. We fortified walls and established watch teams day and night to keep everyone safe. We were survivors determined not to forget those we had lost to this nightmarish creature that had inexplicably invaded our town. As time went on, we learned to live with the shadow this tragedy cast over us Briarwood was forever changed. We held on to one simple truth. Survival was a hard-fought victory against an enemy that defied all logic and understanding. It was a sunny afternoon as I, Stanley Fitzhugh, walked into Wispy Woods, a lesser-known reserve located in rural Montana. The air felt crisp against my skin. A light breeze brushed past the tree branches above. Stories of strange occurrences in these woods had circulated throughout my small town for as long as I could remember. Growing up, I harbored an innate curiosity towards the unknown, which led me to study forensics. I had recently been laid off from my job, leaving me with ample time to finally investigate the claims and trace their veracity. Armed with a camera, notebook, and a wry smile painted on my lips, I expressed a quiet confidence. As my feet seamlessly guided me deeper into the woods, the soft crunching of leaves underfoot echoed all around. Strangely enough, no sounds of wildlife could be heard. Somewhere nearby, footsteps interrupted my thoughts. Heart racing, I stopped in my tracks and listened intently. Fear suddenly clawed its way into my mind as the steps grew louder until... Evening, Stanley! Charlie Jackson appeared from behind a cluster of trees with his usual friendly grin. His sudden entrance had me simultaneously relieved and irritated. Oh, hey, Charlie, I said while lowering my camera. You scared me there for a moment. Charlie laughed good-naturedly and clapped me on the shoulder as he joined me on my trek into the woods. The evening carried on uneventfully. We engaged in conversations and shared jokes as we explored deeper into wispy woods until darkness crept upon us like a thick blanket. Stepping over twisted roots and dead leaves, we switched on our flashlights to penetrate through the nearly opaque blackness surrounding us. Out of nowhere, we stumbled upon an old rusty shed sitting in a small clearing. As curious as it was unexpected, this sinister-looking structure piqued our intrigue further. Eyeing each other cautiously, we approached with flashlights in hand. Creaking open the shed door, we saw what appeared to be freshly dirted tools hung upon the walls flanked by metal contraptions gleaming under our torchlight. A scent of copper lingered heavily in the air. Letting out a sharp gasp, Charlie dropped his flashlight in utter shock. I directed mine towards the ground and found a grisly sight, a pool of dark red liquid soaked into the soil. Panicking, we sprinted away from the shed and back into the woods, trying to retrace our steps to find an escape. Moonlight barely broke through the tree cover, leaving us immersed in a dense darkness that threatened to consume us entirely. Trying to save my breath for running, I shouted at Charlie as calmly as I could manage. Call for help. We need to find our way out. Fumbling with his phone and cursing under his breath, Charlie's trembling fingers dialed 911. No signal. 
he exhaled sharply. Hopelessness washed over us, realizing we were stuck in these woods that had always harbored sinister rumors. Panic gripped onto our very beings. As we continued running blind through the darkness, hoping against hope that we would stumble upon an exit, a noise like tearing fabric reverberated throughout Wispy Woods, and then silence once again reigned over us. I stopped abruptly, panting hard and frantically scanning for Charlie's figure by my side. Instead, I found myself alone in the dark void that pressed menacingly against me from all sides. And then I saw it, a creature unlike anything I had ever imagined. Its reptilian skin shimmered under the weak moonlight that broke through the dense foliage above. Standing hunched over at nearly eight feet tall, its alien-like eyes were cold and emotionless as they fixated on my every move. In its scaly, clawed hands I saw what made my blood run cold, Charlie's lifeless body, limbs grotesquely twisted in ways that shouldn't have been humanly possible. The monster observed me intently before discarding Charlie's ravaged form and lunging forward with incredible speed. I dodged out of the way, narrowly avoiding the creature's lunge. Adrenaline coursed through my veins as my mind raced to come up with a plan to escape this nightmare. Instinctively, I spotted a large branch on the ground, picked it up, and threw it in the opposite direction of where I planned to run. As the creature was distracted by the noise, I sprinted away, desperate to win some distance between myself and this merciless being. The terror of losing Charlie weighed on me, yet staying alive had become my sole priority. I once again tried to call for help. However, just like before, there was no signal. Realistically, the forest wasn't massive. I knew that somewhere there had to be an entrance— or a pathway leading back to civilization. As I ran blindly through the woods, I occasionally paused to listen for any sounds betraying its pursuit. Without warning, I tripped over something jutting out of the ground and fell hard on my face. Scrambling to my feet, I quickly realized what caused my stumble a paved pathway beneath me. My heart soared at this small victory that provided hope for escape. Continuing along the path's twists and turns, faster than I'd previously considered possible, I eventually burst out onto a well-lit road. My relief was tangible as I scanned around for any signs of life. Spotting a gas station not too far away, I sprinted toward it desperately. Once inside, I begged the attendant to call 911 and explain frantically about Charlie's gruesome fate and my narrow escape from what only could be described as an alienish beast hunting us through wispy woods. Keeping their distance, locals from all around whispered in confusion and morbid curiosity as they listened keenly. It was clear they'd never encountered anything like this. Finally, when deputies from the nearest sheriff's office arrived at the scene, I gave the detailed account of our tragic ordeal. The sheriff led a search party into Wispy Woods to hunt the monstrous creature and recover Charlie's remains. I anxiously waited at the station, risking my sanity by recalling every gruesome detail of the nightmarish ordeal. I tried desperately to forget how the reptilian beast's eyes fixated on me, its alien features enough to induce paralyzing fear especially knowing it had taken my best friend from me without hesitation or remorse. Upon their return, the weary searchers brought news that they'd found Charlie's body in a macabre state, confirming my grim recollection. However, they'd found no trace of the creature. The woods were quiet and devoid of anything matching my description, as if nature itself refused to admit such a monstrosity's existence. Though heavily doubted and criticized for what many believed to be wild fabrications, I maintained my story's truth feeling that owed it to Charlie. Overwhelmed with skepticism and hardly any evidence to support myself besides my best friend's unexplained death and mutilation, 
it became seemingly impossible to make them understand the horror I experienced. I will never forget that nightmarish encounter in Wispy Woods as long as I live. As for the creature surely somewhere hidden within those trees it remains a terrifying enigma masked by nature itself. There are days when I feel compelled to seek answers. However, in this case some mysteries may be better left unsolved and untouched. Charlie serves as a chilling reminder of Wispy Wood's dark secret now, his life taken far too soon by an unimaginable reality lurking within our world, mercilessly hunting innocent human prey. Those chilling memories will haunt me forevermore. All that's left is to pay my respects to Charlie while doing whatever it takes to ensure nobody else suffers such a horrific fate at the hands of that unspeakable monster lurking just beyond the reach of civilization. I woke up to the sound of my dog barking furiously outside. My name is Samson Rogers, an accountant by profession, living a simple life here in Asheville, Montana. Married for six years, loving wife named May, tolerated her snoring every night until she left me with nothing but a note and her memories. As I went to check on my dog's commotion, the sky looks unusually dark with scattered clouds filled with mystery. Neighbors' lights flicker as winds howl through what's left of the once vibrant streets. Asherville was a peaceful town until the disappearance of little Tommy what's last week. Leaning against my fence with grass-stained slippers, I spotted my neighbor Robert Cadwell calmly smoking his cigarette, letting the wind carry a raspy chuckle. Rough night? He shouted over to me. You could say that. I replied while spotting my dog in a frenzy near the woods. Grabbing hold of the leash, I yanked him back with all my might just before noticing something lurking just inside the tree lean. Robert caught sight as well and mentioned he'd been seeing odd shadows in the woods lately. Did you try calling animal control? I asked him. I did, he said flatly. Something about an issue with their phone lines, though. Figures. Suddenly there was a blood-curdling scream emanating from deeper within our eerie hometown forest. A knot formed in my stomach as Robert and I exchanged tense glances. Downing his cigarette and stomping out the orange glow on the wet pavement, Robert joined me as we made our way cautiously towards where I had seen the shadowy figure near the woods earlier. Upon closer inspection, it began to take form somewhat of a mixture between man and wolf standing upright on two massive legs covered in thick matted fur. Its eyes burned red with malice as if searching for its next victim. We should have turned back but bravery or fear, I'm not sure. We ventured deeper into the woods. As we made our way towards the unnerving scream, sharp sounds echoed all around us. We glanced at one another nervously, either man capable of expressing the words on our mind. Had we become the hunted? Hearing rustling behind us, we spun around to see red eyes glaring back at us from the shadows. The creature approached slowly, deliberately, as if savoring our fear. With adrenaline coursing through our veins and hearts pounding in our throats, we stumbled blindly through the darkness. Branches clawed at our faces like bony fingers trying to suffocate us, while cold raindrops pelted down from above. Suddenly, Robert tripped over a hodgepodge of twisted roots protruding from the ground. Horror set in as I kneeled down to help him up and noticed blood seeping onto his jeans from a fresh gash on his leg. The guttural growls behind us intensified as the creature closed in. Its putrid breath filled our nostrils, making it impossible not to gag. Realizing there was no time left, we hurried on, each tree a blur commanded by terror itself. Reaching a clearing where moonlight fought against thick cloud cover to grant slivers of visibility, 
we came upon what would most certainly be our grisly fate if luck weren't on our side. A tight circle of blood-stained trees stood sentinel around a makeshift pit littered with remnants of past victims, some with missing limbs while others had been devoured entirely leaving only mangled bones picked clean. Tethering my dog securely while reaching for my concealed pistol, I mustered every ounce of courage as I prepared to face whatever death approached with fangs bared and bloodlust in its eyes. I gripped the pistol, assessing the situation, while Robert struggled to catch his breath. Suddenly, the guttural growls ceased as if the creature was waiting for our next move. Robert, do you think you can walk? I whispered, trying to keep my voice steady. He nodded weakly clutching his wounded leg. Knowing we couldn't outrun the creature, I decided to call for help. I fumbled in my pocket for my phone, but as I dialed 911, I lost signal. Panic threatened to overcome me. We were truly alone. As we stumbled further into the clearing with my dog at our side, we heard a low growl from behind us. The creature stepped out from between the trees and into the moonlight. It stood well over six feet tall, looming menacingly with its muscular body covered in thick black fur. Its snout curled up into a snarl revealing vicious yellow teeth dripping with saliva. Red eyes burned like embers against the night sky as it circled us. Seeing no other choice but to defend ourselves, I raised my pistol and fired three shots right at the monster's chest. However, my weapon seemed to have no impact. It continued stalking us as though unfazed. The beast lunged at us with a fierce snarl and supernatural speed. Narrowly evading it, Robert tripped over a rock and collapsed again in agony. My chest tightened as I realized he could hardly move anymore. Attempting to escape was futile. Stay here. Don't move. I told him before yelling at my loyal canine companion. Go. Run home. Get help. My dog hesitated but eventually obeyed and bolted into the darkness as fast as its paws could carry him. Determined not to let Robert die for nothing. I buttoned up my coat and approached the monstrosity once more with trembling hands gripping the pistol. The creature snarled and crouched low, preparing to strike. Suddenly, unexpected headlights pierced the darkness and bathed the clearing in white light. My dog had returned with help. Just in time, a police officer looking for something had taken notice of my distressed canine companion and followed him to our location. His bright glare disoriented the creature, forcing it to retreat temporarily behind a cluster of trees. Robert's overwhelmed eyes glazed over as he lay on the muddy ground, on the brink of unconsciousness but with an unfamiliar hope. Don't worry, we'll get you out of here. I told him as I turned my attention back towards the tree line where the wolf-like monster still lingered its red eyes burning with anger and vengeance under the cover of foliage. Glancing at my empty pistol, I realized that it won't kill this nightmare. The officer called for backup while keeping a watchful eye on our surroundings. The minutes of our wait seemed to stretch into hours, each passing heartbeat a reminder that we were far from safe. When additional officers arrived, they worked quickly to secure Robert onto a stretcher, and load him into an ambulance. He gripped my hand tightly and gave me a weak smile before his eyes closed. I knew he was grateful for my actions today. As they drove away, I informed the officers about our attacker, a seemingly invincible wolf-like creature that pursued us relentlessly through the dark forest. They exchanged doubtful glances but decided to launch a thorough investigation considering what they'd seen themselves. In all my life, I never thought I would encounter such a nightmarish creature like this, something so seemingly unnatural yet exhibiting traits and motivations frighteningly close to humanistic tendencies. Dark whispers started surfacing in town organizing search parties braced against fear and mystery. 
No one had seen these shores devoid of sunlight and happiness. Innocence lay scattered amongst the blood-stained branches. Reality had intertwined with folklore, and my understanding of the world around me crumbled. What hides in the dark waiting to strike is unknown. The only certainty is the need to protect our loved ones against those creatures and hold on to the hope that, together, we can survive the most gruesome of battles. Though our attacker escaped into obscurity, its presence throughout our town will never fade. As we began rebuilding our lives, the memories of those we lost haunted us like a perpetual shadow, their faces etched into every corner of town, existing as a chilling reminder that sometimes man's most daunting enemy is the darkness within. A few short years ago, I spent some time down in the Everglades. Looking back, I wish I'd stayed home. It wasn't a total bust, mind you. I liked the outdoors, and the swamp had a certain raw beauty the city could never offer. But sometimes, beauty can deceive, and in the muck and mire of those wetlands, there's more danger than meets the eye. My plan was simple spend a few days out in the wild, hike some trails, and maybe do a bit of fishing on the side. I liked my solitude, and the thought of leaving behind the crowds and constant hum of urban life was exhilarating. I packed up my gear, stowed it in my old Ford, and hit the road south towards Naples. I figured I'd snag a motel room there and head out into the swamp come morning. The drive was long, the humidity thick by the time I pulled into the closest town. I found a cheap motel, nothing fancy, just four walls and a bed. The place looked like it hadn't seen a fresh coat of paint in a decade, but I wasn't picky. It was approaching dusk when I finally checked in, the clerk barely glancing up from the tattered paperback she clutched in her grease-stained fingers. Room 12. She tossed me a chip key, the number barely visible on the fob. Thanks, I said. She just grunted in response. The room was about as welcoming as the receptionist. Musty air, flickering lights, the carpet stained with what I hoped was just spilled coffee. I was half tempted to just sleep in the truck, to hell with it. That's when I saw the back door. It led directly outside, away from the main cluster of rooms, down a long, overgrown path. It opened onto a little patch of wilderness that edged up to a dense tangle of trees, a perfect entry point to the swamp. Something about the overgrown trail and that wild green fringe felt right. Motels and asphalt weren't why I came out here. I grabbed my backpack and headed off down the path, the sun already beginning its dip below the horizon. The air was thick, heavy with buzzing insects and the sweet almost rotten scent of decay. As I walked, the path narrowed, the trees crowding in, the light fading with each step. I should have been getting worried, but the thrill I felt outweighed common sense. The path forked suddenly, one branch petering out into thick brush, the other opening onto a wide clearing. In the middle of the clearing, a cabin, small, built from rough timber, it looked almost swallowed by the dense vegetation. Smoke drifted from the chimney, the scent of burning wood cutting through the thick tropical air. Weird, considering how isolated it seemed. I debated backtracking, but curiosity won out. As I approached, a figure stepped onto the porch. Tall, wiry, shrouded in a thick fisherman's jacket and wide-brimmed hat that hid most of their face. Lost? The voice was rough, edged with an accent I couldn't quite place. Uh, no, but kinda turned around, I responded. The figure tilted its head, a gesture I took as an unspoken invitation. I cautiously made my way closer. You heading into the swamp? The figure asked, the hat never moving an inch, 
the face beneath still in shadow. Yeah, figured I'd camp out a few days, check out some hiking and stuff. There was a long pause. Not much of a hiker, are you? The voice had a slight chuckle to it this time. Something in the tone made me bristly. I looked down and realized I was wearing sandals. Not exactly the smartest footwear for traversing swamp territory. Just getting started. I lied, feeling my face warming a bit. Reckon you could use a guide, the figure said. Swamp can be tricky for newcomers. Easy to get turned around. Easy to disappear. Those last words sent a chill through me, but something about the figure felt. Familiar isn't the right word, but safe, perhaps. There was no menace in the tone, just a quiet assurance. I could leave, of course, but something pulled me toward this strange encounter in the fading light. Name's Elias, I said, extending a hand. The figure ignored it. I know folks call me Zeke. The voice had a rasp to it, like the sound of dry leaves scraping against stone. Could take you out, show you the ropes, as they say. How much would that cost me? My practical side finally kicked in. Zeke laughed, low and rumbling. More than money, I wager. But if you're willing to pay, we could strike a deal. Now, I'm not a superstitious sort, but alarm bells went off in my head. I tried to backpedal a bit, muttering something about needing to think about it. Zeke didn't seem to mind. Cabin's open if you want a warm bed for the night. Head on back to your metal box in the morning if you fancy. There was a finality in that statement, and I found myself nodding and retreating. Back at the motel, I tossed and turned. Seek the smoky cabin, the whole encounter played on loop in my mind. Should I just bail, head home? But I'd come all this way, and damn it, now I was itching to know more about that shadowed figure and his offer. I spent a fitful night in the stained motel bed, and by morning, I knew what I wanted. I figured I'd at least head back to the clearing, talk some more with Zeke. A deal with the devil, maybe, but sometimes curiosity is the stronger sin. The path, familiar now, led me right back to the cabin. This time, the door stood open, and Zeke sat on the porch, whittling away at a stick. As I approached, he glanced up, the brim of his hat tilting just a bit. It felt like a knowing smile, even if I couldn't see it. Ready to see what the swamp has to hide? His voice had the same gravelly quality as before. I nodded. Then follow. Zeke rose and moved into the cabin. I hesitated only a moment before following suit. Inside, it was dim, the single window draped with a thick, mildewed blanket. Sparsely furnished, a wood stove, a cot, a table strewn with strange bottles and jars, their contents murky and unidentifiable. The place gave me the creeps, but Zeke seemed oblivious, moving towards the back of the cabin, his boots creaking on the warped wooden floorboards. He stopped before a ragged curtain hanging across a doorway. I could feel the prickle of sweat along my back. I couldn't explain the unease settling over me, only that whatever lay behind that curtain was something I wasn't meant to see. Last chance to run, Elias, Zeke said, his voice now edged with steel. I should have listened. Of course I didn't. I'd ventured too far to back out now. With a trembling hand, I pulled back the curtain. The room was small, dimly lit by a single oil lamp. I couldn't see everything clearly, but there was a figure in there, tied to a chair. Gagged. A man, judging by the build. Eyes wild and bulging, staring at me in desperate terror. I recoiled. What the hell is this? I hissed at Zeke. Wordlessly, Zeke pulled a vicious, curved blade from his jacket and turned towards the terrified man. The swamp demands blood, boy. 
You come seeking its secrets, then you must feed it. This, he gestured towards the man in the chair, is the price. Before I could react, Seek was upon him. A scream, muffled by the gag but no less piercing for it, a spray of crimson across the dusty floor, and then a dreadful silence. I don't know if I fainted or just closed my eyes. But when I next became aware of my surroundings, I was on the floor of the cabin, my heart pounding, Zeke standing over me, that blood-stained knife in hand. You fed it, Elias, he said, almost gently. Now it'll walk with you. From that moment on, everything changed. Zeke led me deep into the swamp, places no map would ever show. Days blurred into nights, the usual markers of time fading beneath the heavy canopy of mangroves. He taught me things, how to track not just animals, but other creatures, how to survive on roots and swamp water, and how to listen to the whispers on the wind. There were others like Zeke living out there, hidden in plain sight. Folks who vanished from the regular world, taken in by the swamp and turned into something else. I learned that every generation or so, the swamp demanded a sacrifice. The why of it, even Zeke couldn't tell me. Maybe there was no reason at all, just the old, hungry magic of places where land and water meet. Those chosen, or foolish, enough to venture into those depths paid the price to appease whatever dark force coiled beneath the brackish waters. I'm one of the lucky ones, I suppose. I made it out. It happened a few years back, just another dumb tourist trip gone bad. I never talk about it much folks tend to either think I'm crazy or spin some yarn about how I must have been messed up on swamp weed or who knows what. Truth is, I was as sober then as I am right now. Maybe that's what makes it stick with me even more. I'd been fixing to head down to Naples, Florida for a bit. Figured I'd stay in some cheap motel, hit the beach, maybe do some fishing. Not a fancy vacation, but I was tired of the city grind, needed a change of scenery. The Everglades were on the way, and I had this itch to explore them see a real, untouched piece of wilderness, you know? That's how it started. The drive was long, and by the time I hit the edge of the swamp, it was late afternoon. Humidity hung in the air like a wet blanket, and the buzz of insects was deafening. I pulled off at the first exit with a sign for the Big Cypress National Preserve and figured I'd snag a room there, then head into the swamp the next morning. I drove up to this weathered old ranger station to ask about motels. Place was deserted, except for a lone figure leaning against the railing. Didn't get a good look at first he had his back to me, hat pulled low over his face. Excuse me, I called out. Know any spots around here I could spend the night? He turned slowly, and even though the sun was dipping below the trees, I could see his eyes gleam from beneath the wide brim of his hat. Place in town suit you just fine, he said, voice low and gravelly. Roads ain't safe around here at night. For a second, I hesitated. Something about the guy, about the way the light seemed to catch oddly on him, gave me the willies. But hell, it was just the backwards vibe I figured. Ranger types can be a little off sometimes. Appreciate it, I replied. Where's the nearest town? Ain't no town nearby, he said, that strange gleam still in his eyes. But if you follow that road, he pointed out to where the highway stretched back from the ranger station, you'll find a place to rest for the night. Now, even if I'd been the world's biggest idiot, I'd have thought twice about that. I mean, who tells you to just drive blind down a dark road? But like I said, I was itching to get into the park, 
and the sooner I settled for the night, the sooner I could start my adventure. I thanked him, headed back to my car, and hit the road. That road wound deeper and deeper into the swamp. The further I went, the thicker the tangle of trees became, the shadows seemed to stretch across the asphalt like grasping hands. My headlights barely cut into the gloom. After what felt like an hour, I saw a break in the trees to the left and a sign with the word, Motel just barely visible in the dim light. Now I'm no luxury traveler. But as I pulled up to this place and saw the peeling paint, the boarded-up windows, and the general air of decay, I felt a deep pit open up in my stomach. The feeling only worsened as I got out and approached the reception, which looked more like an abandoned shack tacked onto the side of the motel. Nobody was at the desk. A lone bell sat there, tarnished and silent. I rang it once, twice, but only the echo of distant croaking frogs answered me. Hello? I called out, but the darkness seemed to swallow the sound whole. Just as I was about to head back and sleep in my car, I heard something move behind the reception desk. A figure materialized out of the gloom, tall and thin, shrouded in what looked like an oversized fisherman's jacket. A strange stillness filled the air, a prickly chill running down my spine. The person, and I hesitate to call them that, tilted their head, a motion that seemed wrong somehow, almost bird-like. Room for the night? Its voice rasped in the darkness, low and inhuman. My survival instincts were screaming at me to leave. But the thought of sleeping in my car amongst whatever creatures lurked in the swamp seemed almost worse. My mouth moved before my brain caught up. Yeah, if you've got one. The figure nodded, a smooth, strange motion then produced a key. Room 13. It held the key out towards me, bony fingers pale as moonlight against the black jacket. Dread washed over me, strong enough to drown out the logical voice yelling that the number 13 was the last damn straw. The figure waited, unmoving. And I, like a fool, I took the key. The room was a nightmare. Filthy sheets, flickering light bulb, and a strange, putrid smell that made me gag. I should have just turned and left. But I convinced myself it wasn't that bad. I wasn't picky. I just needed a few hours of sleep and then I could hit the park. I even rationalized the smell. Swamp gas, probably, leaking in from somewhere. I tossed my backpack onto the rickety chair opposite the bed and decided to stretch my legs before turning in. There was a path that led from the motel, directly into the swamp. Now, this wasn't the sanctioned park kind of path, but more like a deer trail, barely worn into the dense undergrowth. Figuring some fresh air would do me good, I headed down. The air was thick with the buzz of mosquitoes and the damp scent of rotting leaves. The path narrowed quickly, and soon I was scrambling through vines and pushing branches aside. Then, the path opened into a clearing right in the middle of the clearing stood a cabin. Small, rough-hewn, and with a plume of smoke curling from the chimney. It seemed as out of place as that fancy hotel would have been. Before I could dwell on it too much, someone stepped onto the porch. The same person from the motel, the tall, thin figure draped in the fisherman's jacket, had still covering most of their face. Lost? The voice was the same as before, that same rough rasp like stones scraping together. Just exploring. I replied, suddenly feeling very, very far from home. The figure tilted its head again and beckoned me closer with a strangely smooth motion. I hesitated but then found my feet moving forward. The figure turned away and walked into the cabin. I followed, drawn against my better judgment. Inside, the cabin was dim and smelled strongly of herbs and something else, something sour that pricked at the back of my nose. 
There was a fire pit in the center, a heavy iron pot hanging above it. Off to the side, what looked like bundles of dried plants strung from the ceiling. And then I saw, to my horror, that something was moving in a chair in the corner. Someone was tied to it, gagged and struggling against their restraints. It took me a moment to register that it was a man, eyes wide with a panic that mirrored my own. He stared at me, frantic and desperate, but could only let out a muffled grunt. I turned to the figure by the fire, but he'd pulled a curved, wicked-looking blade from his jacket. I don't know if I even tried to shout, my throat seemed to close up. Before I could process further, he moved on the man in the chair, fast and inhuman. A scream, piercing but cut short, then a choking gurgle, and then the terrible silence that fell after. I stumbled back, retching, but the figure was already turning towards me, that blade slick with blood in his gaunt hand. Run, he rasped, and the word was barely human, more like the caw of a swamp bird. Then I did run. I tore through the undergrowth, branches whipping against my face, thorns tearing at my skin. I could hear him behind me, not running, but gliding through the trees with an impossible, fluid speed. The path seemed to stretch forever before me, the motel a distant, flickering hope in the sea of darkness. Just as I thought my lungs would burst, I saw a break in the trees. The motel, or what was left of it. I stumbled out onto the crumbling asphalt, gasping for breath. But then I froze. Across the lot, leaning against an overturned trash bin, was the figure from the cabin. He stood as still as a statue, the moonlight glinting off the dripping blade in his hand. He tilted his head, that terrible, bird-like motion, and for a moment I thought it was over. Then he turned and vanished into the swamp, leaving me alone amongst the ruins. I stumbled into my room, locked the door, and cowered there until the first rays of dawn painted the sky. I don't know how long I sat there, shaking, trying to process what had happened. Come daylight I crept out. My car was the only one left in the lot. I didn't enter the reception, didn't want to see what waited within. I drove out of there, fast as I could, out of the swamp, out of the state, until only the endless hum of the highway separated me from the horrors I'd left behind. I never stopped not to rest, not until I was far enough away that I convinced myself it must have been a nightmare. The news reports started a few days later. Missing hiker in the big cypress. Body never found. Then another, and another. At first, the news called it animal attacks, maybe gators gone rogue. But then stories started filtering out, witnesses in the nearest town, Whispers about strange figures in the swamp, disappearances that didn't add up. The locals had a name for it, some old legend I'd never heard before, the skunk ape. Maybe it was that, maybe something else. All I knew was that I'd seen it firsthand, the darkness beneath the shimmer of the swamp. I never went back to the Everglades. There are some places a man just isn't meant to tread. The memory still haunts me, more so now since I know I wasn't the only one. I see those news reports, those missing faces, and I know the truth. The swamp is still hungry, and it still waits. It's not just the nightmares that get me, though those come plenty. It's what the swamp did to me, even without a scratch on my body. I still jump at shadows, still find myself staring into the trees, certain I see the glint of those eyes. I used to love the outdoors, now even a city park makes my skin crawl. I don't know if the thing in the swamp will ever be caught, ever be stopped. But I tell you this, if you ever decide to take a moonlit stroll through the Everglades— if you ever hear the whisper of a voice that promises safe haven and unseen wonders, you turn around. You turn around, 
and you run for your life. A couple years back, I went hiking out in the Superstition Mountains with my buddies. You ever been? Those desert peaks just east of Phoenix? It's rugged, and that's why we loved it. Gives you a sense of real adventure when you finally stand on a summit, like you earned it. Anyways, this was in fall. Weather's starting to cool down. Snakes aren't so active. Good timing. Me, along with Kellen and Deirdre. Now, their names aren't so common. If you noticed, figured we'd tackle Flatiron Peak via the Siphon Draw Trail. Not too crowded, nice challenge. It's about half a day out there, but we planned well, tons of water. You gotta in that heat. Start off early, and the sun's low on the horizon, which turns those rock layers all sorts of golden and red. Makes you stop for a photo. But we gotta make time, so we push on. There's the usual desert things, prickly pear, cholia, lizards skittering in the shade. This being November, you even get some wildflowers still clinging on. Not many people out that morning either, but that's what we hoped for. About halfway up, you hit this huge open basin before the serious climb starts. That's where I noticed it, or rather, didn't notice it. Deirdre, you ever go hiking with the same friends long enough? It's eerie how in tune you get. She pointed back the way we came, frowning. Thought I heard something, she said. We froze, listening. Just wind whipping past the rocks. Deirdre shrugged, and I swear, right as we relaxed, something snapped in the canyon behind us. We whipped around, and, well, nothing. Scrub, some boulders, maybe space for someone to hide, if they were trying real hard. But no movement, no person. That's probably what gets folks spooked up here. All the tales about missing hikers and old Apache curses. It's always explained way with heat exhaustion, getting turned around. Still makes you feel uneasy. Kellen shook his head, all practical. Probably an animal. Deer, something like that. Logically, he was right. But even so... That feeling didn't leave. The thing about feeling, though, is that it ain't evidence. So we moved on. Had the summit to reach. That peak is mean, especially from this direction. It was well past noon when we got to the top, and we were beat. Ate lunch quick, snapped a few selfies like idiots, and headed back down. Now, here's the thing about retracing steps— on one hand, it's easier, downhill all the way. On the other, it makes it obvious if someone, or something, is following you. I'm Vance, by the way. Halfway to that flat basin again, and that dread was back. This time, though, it wasn't just a sound. I caught some flicker of motion down a side gully. Stopped us all short. I saw Deirdre tense up hand inching towards her hiking knife. She was military, not the type to spook easy. This was bad. It's nothing, Kellen said, that nervousness peeking through his cool voice. Vance, you're paranoid, come on. I don't know why, but then I took a look at the ground. This ain't your smooth, packed trail anymore. Lots of loose rocks out here, and right there was a footprint. Except, not human. More like a deer, if a deer wore boots two sizes too large. We all saw it, and any remaining jokes died. You hear stories, out here in the wilderness, and yeah, mostly it's nonsense. But a few, maybe, just maybe, something sticks around in those old places. I looked up the gully again, this time going real slow scanning every boulder and shadow. That flicker again, and it looked like a person just ducking out of sight. 
but the way they moved off, just something wrong about it. That settled it. I pointed back towards the peak, voice strained. Screw it, we're climbing back up. You kidding? Kellen burst out, but Deirdre cut him off. He's right. That thing can't follow us up those ledges. So we went back up the mountain. Was brutal, I won't lie. Legs burned, water was starting to get real low. All the while, we kept catching glimpses. There, under that outcropping, behind that bush, always right when you focused, it was gone. Like it was taunting us. I started thinking about those missing hiker cases. Did they feel like this? Like prey? The sun was already starting to set by the time we got back to the flat top. Kellen and Deirdre looked about half dead, and I wasn't much better. Still, up here, at least we were in the open. That thing, whatever it was, it liked hiding spots. But we also couldn't stay here forever. It was nearly full dark when we started down again. Kellen had the brilliant idea of us sticking close, flashlights blazing. The light played weird tricks in the twilight turning every stone into a lurking shape. Twice, I swore I saw eyes shine back at us, and those weren't natural eyes either. More like glowing amber embers. We just gritted our teeth and kept moving. It wasn't until we neared the base of the mountain, almost to the parking lot, that things truly kicked off. Deirdre and I saw it together, the shape lunging for Kellen. Didn't even shout, just grabbed him and yanked him off the path. That bought us all time. It scrambled past, landing in the dirt between us. Not graceful like an animal, all stiff-legged and twitchy, but fast. And that's when I saw it right, saw those messed-up boots for real. Saw the fur on its hide, rough, patched like mange. Its hands, long and crooked, Ended in claws, not hands exactly. Then its head whipped around, too far, unnatural. Empty black eyes glared, with this gaping maw of misaligned teeth. It was all wrong, everything. Run! I shouted, and somehow, my legs remembered how. We tore off down the trail, blindly stumbling with terror. It seemed to chase Deirdre at first and I heard her shriek, a shriek more like an animal's howl. Then, a different sound, awful, wet. When I dared look back, the thing was gone. So was Deirdre. Her flashlight lay smashed in the middle of the trail, blood pooled there like an evil spotlight. Kellen ran right over it, didn't stop, and neither did I. My lungs hurt, my feet were ripped up, but the parking lot came into view. That's when I heard another shout behind Kellen. And a howl, that terrible, rasping howl, cutting right through the night. My guts felt hollow. Then a gunshot. Kellen's, he brought his hunting pistol. Another howl, more pain this time. Then, blessed silence. I skidded to a stop by my truck, gasping. But I couldn't move, couldn't make myself climb in and leave. Footsteps fell behind me, and a hand closed rough on my shoulder. Kellen stumbled around, blood smearing his face. Gotta drive. He coughed. Gotta. I got us in the truck. Got us off that mountain and back to the city. There were paramedics there, police at the ranger station. I don't remember clearly— only snippets, how Callan kept ranting about some awful deer wolf, how they looked at me like I was crazy. Deirdre never showed up. I didn't push about the thing we chased, you understand. They chalked it up to mountain lion, or bear, even, though none of us believed it. Whatever it was, whatever we left up there. Months later, Kellen moved away, said he couldn't take the desert any more. I get why. Can't shake the memory, or the look from its eyes. I keep finding myself online, late at night, 
reading all those old legends, trying to put a name to it. I think now Skinwalker is as close as you get. The things don't die, it says. Only way is never looking back. So, that's my plan. Not gonna get me too, damn it. A couple years back, I went hiking. That's what I tell people whenever they ask about the scars. No one needs to know what really happened. It's my story, and I'll stick to the simple lies. I live out on California's central coast. I always have, born and raised in Templeton, near Paso Robles. Some folks consider this rural life, but when you grow up here, it's just home. One weekend, though, I needed to clear my head. Cabin rental sounded just about right. After I did some browsing, I booked a weekend in the Sequoia National Forest. I told a buddy and my sister where I was going, what trailheads I'd check out, even shared my campsite details, safety first, as they always say. Packing took barely any time. Hiking boots, jeans, long sleeve shirt, snacks and water, standard weekend adventure kit. Hitting the road Friday, I made my way towards the heart of those magnificent, ancient trees. As soon as I pulled in, I knew I made the right call coming out here. That quiet, the way the light falls through the towering redwoods, you don't get that out on the coast. First evening was easy. Unpack, cook some camp food, read a bit to the sound of crickets, gaze up at the stars, then call it a night. Slept like a rock, too. Morning couldn't come fast enough. After a quick breakfast, I laced up those boots and grabbed my pack. Saturday day hike looked perfect. No more than five miles round trip. Gradual elevation gain. Nothing extreme. Most folks head into the main forest, those areas near the General Sherman tree, the massive beasts everyone wants to see. Me? I like the more isolated patches, less crowd, more nature. That day, I went north. It started off ordinary enough. Trail was well marked, scenery stunning. About a mile in, the forest got strangely dense. Even with the high sun, light barely filtered through, almost giving it a dusk feeling. That was fine. Trails can shift like that. Didn't give it much thought. Something did catch my attention about another half mile further in. Bones. Scattered all over the path. Didn't look human, thank goodness. Deer? Elk? Whatever it was, the carcass had been picked clean. Maybe this stretch of the trail wasn't getting as much visitor traffic as I planned. A slight feeling of unease settled in my gut, but I shook it off. I pushed on, needing to keep moving. Then I heard it, a rustling in the underbrush. At first, I thought it was squirrels, maybe a marmot. But as I looked back towards the sound, something big moved beneath the ferns. I froze. A low growl emanated from the dark green growth. And then, eyes. Glowing in the shadows of the dense forest. Not deer eyes, not cat eyes. Wrong shape, wrong slant. I couldn't make out a body. The undergrowth was too thick. Without a second thought, I spun on my heel and ran. It bounded into the open behind me, snarling a deep throaty noise I'd never heard before. Panic surged through me as I saw my first clear glimpse of the thing. Hulking shape, easily seven feet tall even when hunched over. Legs too long, bent backwards in a way that sent chills down my spine. Fur matted and dark, and as it opened its maw, those bone-colored teeth seemed too many, too jagged. Its speed was shocking, covering ground twice as fast as me. No amount of wilderness skill could outrun a beast like that. Terror fueled my desperation. 
It chased me deeper into the woods, off the trail, scrambling through thorny bushes, over mossy rocks. Tripping forward, I saw a massive redwood stump and threw myself behind it for a tiny bit of cover. I peered around, heart hammering. It was circling, not coming forward directly. A terrifying thought hit me. This thing wasn't just some rabid animal. It was smart, toying with its prey. In that instant, I decided if I was going down, I'd fight. Glancing around, I found a branch lying on the ground, thick and sturdy, at least two feet long. Gripping it tight in both hands, I braced myself. If that thing came at me, I'd put up all the fight I could muster. A sound came from behind me, the snapping of twigs. Whirling around, I raised the branch as high as I could and lunged forward. Nothing there. I froze again, sweating in the sudden silence. Slowly, with a sickening sense of dread, I turned to face my true stalker. There it was, not even ten feet away. That hunched frame, those yellow eyes burning with intelligence, that muzzle twisted in what I can only describe as a predatory grin. With a growl it charged. I barely had time to throw up the branch before it slammed into me with the force of a freight train. The flimsy stick offered no defense, shattering under the force of impact. It knocked the wind out of me, but the real pain came when its claws reached my skin, shredding through my shirt and biting deep into my shoulder. I remember screaming, more in surprise than anything. There was a sharp flash of pain, and then it jerked back. In that instant, I caught a glimpse of the branch jutting out of its flank, just below the ribs. My futile defense had struck a lucky target. It let out a high-pitched yelp I hadn't expected, followed by a growl like thunder. There was a hesitation, a moment of surprise, as if it couldn't comprehend this human food fighting back. That one second was my reprieve. Stumbling backwards, I bolted past it, running blind. Its angry shrieks chased me as I pushed my body past my limits, tearing through the forest, heart pounding, my injured shoulder screaming with each stride. Finally, sheer exhaustion took over and I tripped, my body crumpling in a pile of dirt and dead leaves. I thought I'd black out right then, but a burst of adrenaline jolted me back, my breath rasping in my burning lungs. Scrambling to my feet, I kept running, fueled by panic. Eventually, my lungs could take no more. I slowed down to a jog, then to a walk, forcing myself onward. At some point, my pursuer must have given up the chase. The silence of the forest mocked me, and still I continued, driven by a single thought, get out of this place. As daylight dwindled, I saw it, a road. Not the road to camp, a side road cutting through the forest. Hope ignited within me. Staggering through a final patch of trees, I emerged onto the dirt lane, heart pounding. There, to my absolute disbelief, sat a truck, doors open, engines still rumbling. Running on fumes, I fell towards the driver's side door, yelling with every bit of strength left in me. Inside, two guys dressed in hunting gear stared in open-mouthed shock. In my ragged voice, dripping blood down my tattered shirt, I managed to choke out one word. Help! It all blurs together after that. There were police, questions, and an ambulance ride. They found my camp, they searched the area. No signs of attack, no strange animal footprints. Just blood-soaked dirt where I stumbled around with the branch sticking out of me. And, of course, a ton of doubt cast in my direction. My family and friends thought I was nuts. Animal attack leaving wounds like that didn't add up. They thought I went off hiking alone, maybe hit my head, hallucinated all of it. I told them I'd rather stick with the hiking story, even the fake one. 
that I was glad people don't believe my crazy experience in those woods. I was fine, just needed stitches and bandages. And of course, I needed some strong whiskey to settle the nightmares that followed for months. It took a long time for my shoulder to heal, the scars still an angry mark on my body. They're proof enough for me. Now, people sometimes wonder why I don't hike out on those trails anymore, especially when I say my favorite place is Sequoia National Forest. They assume there must have been a bad memory, some traumatic event to make me steer clear. And yeah, they're right. But what would their reaction be if I described the real reason? That hulking shape in the dense woods, those burning eyes, and that moment of primal fear I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy? Nah, I'll stick with the simple story. It's a lot easier than explaining I encountered a skinwalker out there in the California wilderness. I watched the sun dip below the Rocky Mountains, the last gleam of light vanishing. Frost cracked beneath my boots as I started my evening rounds from the fire lookout tower where I worked, surveying endless miles of Colorado forest. Even after a year up here, solitude nipped at me daily, a relentless vulture. That evening air carried a tang, a mix of pine, earth, and something unfamiliar. I pulled out the binoculars and scanned the horizon for any signs of fire or smoke, but saw nothing beyond the dance of trees in the wind. My name, Booker Tennyson, didn't quite echo around these parts yet. I enjoyed anonymity more than familiarity. The next morning brought a shocking discovery. Three hikers were found in a nearby clearing by some early bird trekkers. Not a single mark on their bodies just pale figures lying still beside their untouched camping gear. Cause unapparent, no wildlife disturbance either. The picturesque setting was corrupted by death's invisible paintbrush. I investigated with local law enforcement, a fresh experience for me after years of avoiding close human contact, with officers scrawling notes as our boots crunched over dry foliage. Traces of what looked like particulate black soot near the site made me think, unreported campfire. But there was no sense of char or burnt wood. As dust settled again, I returned to my tower. A chill seeped through my jacket as I stepped inside, the kind born from within rather than caused by plummeting temperatures. Peculiar noises filtered through the darkness outside. Not animal cries— they were irregular, jarring like mechanical groans lacerating nature's usual symphony. My sole company during these shifts was a radio dispatcher named Kelby, an affable fellow who spoke in high-spirited quips despite mundane conversations about weather patterns and radio checks. We shared a joke about disgruntled squirrels plotting against humans for cutting down nut-bearing trees, brief mirth amidst my growing unease. Days passed with stifling tension hovering over the woods. Visitors dwindled following news reports regarding the incident of the campers. On patrol under the cloak of twilight one evening, the radio staticated into life with Kelby's voice sputtering through. Booker, footage from a wildlife kim near your sector just came in. His sentence broke off into static before it solidified again. Something's out there. Upon reviewing footage at base camp, an elongated shadow was visible amongst tree trunks, far too streamlined for any bear or mountain lion, its outline distorted as if moving through dense fog that wasn't seen on screen nor present during daylight. My sleep became fretful forums for nightmare narratives starring unidentifiable creatures creeping closer to my tower's staircase. Was this some hermit living off-grid with deformed features sculpted by years of isolation? Nightfall loomed once more, and I found myself magnetized at my window overlooking that serene woodland tomb beneath me. 
The scattered moonlight embroidered phantom shapes between tree lines while my breath formed ghosts on pane glass. The radio crackled suddenly. Book! Kelby choked out between frantic breaths. I'd never heard him lose his composure before. It's at your door. It's... The door creaked open below. An instinctive prickle butted along my arms despite commanding myself to disregard foolish fanciful fears that often accompany desolation. Wooden steps protested under deliberate weight, too rhythmic for any creature born from natural order, with each thud climbing upwards toward me. The door swung open wider. I didn't move. Steps approached. They were heavy, intentional. There was no time for a call. The radio lay out of reach, knocked aside in my initial shock. Light from the moon framed a figure in the doorway. A man, largely built, skin stretched over muscle and sinew in unnatural ways. Scars ran across what I could see of him, tales of survival etched deep. Clothes hung in tatters, suggesting months, maybe years, in the wilderness. His eyes locked onto mine, reflecting a predatory intelligence, not an animal, but something far removed from any human I knew. Breath came in huffs visible in the cool air as he studied me. I backed away, hitting the wall behind me. There was no thought of retaliation. I could see the coil in his posture ready to spring. This figure harbored violence deep within its gate an untamed force that made clear any struggle would be pointless. He stepped forward again, and then stopped. A low noise rumbled from within him, not words but a threat made audible. It was clear he could end this if he chose to, yet after long moments where only his ragged breaths filled the cabin, he turned away. I heard him descend the stairs and watched his shadow merge with night's embrace. When search teams arrived at dawn following my distress signal sent when morning allowed, I learned Kelby hadn't made it through the night. He had been found a distance away from my post, evidence of an unspeakable fate marked upon him. After ensuring I hadn't sustained any harm beyond shaken resolve and recounting events as best I could, my report concluded with speculation on the attacker's identity. Strangers speculated on escapees or feral humans but remained unnerved by my description of his disproportionate frame and immense strength. Days grew to weeks as investigators scoured without answers. Fear seeped into every camper's heart still brave enough to venture near those woods. Eventually, I left behind those trees and what they concealed within their shadows— Yet images of that disfigured form at my doorway lingered long after as a grim reminder of how close our world skirts to wildness we scarcely comprehend or acknowledge. I took the job as a fire lookout in the forests of Montana attracted by the solitude and simplicity of the role. My watchtower stood like a sentinel over vast miles of woodland, and my days settled into a rhythm marked by wildlife sightings and hourly weather reports. I lived alone, save for occasional radio chatter, my only human connection. One evening, as amber shades of sunset gave way to twilight— my tranquility shattered with the discovery of something gruesome beside a nearby stream, the remnants of what seemed like a bear attack, an elk torn apart with methodical savagery. Yet in all my years in the wild, I'd never seen a predator feast and leave behind its kills so, selectively. The following days were strained by unease. Trails nearby displayed erratic signs of movement unlike any animal I knew. The woods had been home to creatures that moved silently, but this was different. Branches cracked with weight, yet there were no prints to match. My name is Ezra Quinn, though my fondness for natural isolation made me more a whisper among men than a participant in their affairs. Every now and then, 
Vinny a local ranger and often my supply drop-off would joke about how only someone who preferred trees over people could enjoy such isolation. It was during one such sparse chuckle that I conveyed my concerns over radio. Ezra, he'd said skeptically, you sure you ain't losing touch out there? But his tone shifted when I detailed the scene by the stream. As nights progressed, an inexplicable phenomenon unfolded. Distant thuds progressed into relentless prowling around my tower. Whatever it was appeared calculated, intelligent, hunting not for survival but for something more sinister. Then came an evening where those thuds ceased, replaced by an ominous stillness. That tranquility before storm harbored intensity. Any trained lookout knew it well. This quiet was deceptive. It seemed to mask an intent that transcended natural order. Tension gripped me as darkness encroached one night without even the symphony of cricket chirps. The silence was cut with soft tapping at the tower door below, focused, rhythmic knocks against metal. No animal I knew possessed such deliberate curiosity or eerie persistence. I gripped the radio mic tight but held my breath as another series of taps echoed through the wooden structure. Electricity surged through me as one thought anchored itself firmly. Whatever lay beyond was no mere creature bound by instinct or need. Hunkered down inside my haven, what Vale Harper, my predecessor whose stories I once found apocryphal, mentioned coiled into belief. Something more than animal yet less than man roamed those woods with dark purpose. I waited for the next tap, but it didn't come. Vinny's voice crackled over the radio. Ezra, got a supply run tomorrow. Lock up after dark. I will, I replied, the transmission filling the silence around me. The radio went quiet, but unease lingered in the air. That night I left no door unbarred, no window uncovered. Sleep eluded me. Each creak was a sentinel's call to alertness. Morning broke with no incident. Vinny arrived bearing provisions and news of a missing hiker last seen near my tower. Local search teams were assembling at base. The man's description, mid-thirties, beard, wearing a bright red jacket, matched no one I knew. Vinny noticed my discomfort at the news. You'll let us know if you see anything, right? Of course, I said. That night the forest fell silent once more. In the small hours, a scraping sound against metal jarred me awake. Below, in the barest moonlight, I glimpsed movement, a shape by the tower base. It was tall, broad-shouldered, and had limbs that seemed too long too agile for a human. I reached for the radio but stopped. The creature could cut me off before help arrived. There was one road in or out, and I could not risk leading danger to others. My job was to observe, report, remain undetected. Hours dragged. Dawn approached as did the certainty of imminent confrontation. The shape below moved with purpose now in patterns that hinted at intelligence, perhaps searching for an entry or waiting for me to emerge. Vinny returned on schedule. He found me pale but unharmed with doors still barred. We surveyed the grounds but found no sign of entry, only deep gouges in earth leading back into the woods. The authorities found the missing hiker two days later alive but shaken with no recollection of his time lost in those woods. In time they left and calm returned, but Vinny now checked in daily on more than just dropping supplies. Conversations turned to installations of surveillance cameras and motion sensors around the perimeter through grants from wildlife preservation funds. Some nights still ring silent while rumors circle amongst forestry staff about a possible undiscovered species stalking our woods, powerful enough to challenge bear traps and leave veteran trackers unnerved with their skills rendered ineffective. 
Yet whatever roams out there meets a reinforced stronghold now while I remain vigilant within this tower standing as both home and sentinel against an adversary that treads beyond our understanding, evading every effort to encounter him leaving whispers of fear and respect in his phantom trail through the tanglewood. Mist often cloaked the hiking trails of the Cascades, giving the dense evergreens and rugged terrain an otherworldly feel. People usually enjoyed the serenity, but for me, there was no calm to be found among those trees today. My name is Elwyn Creeley, a scientist with a government agency so covert that even whispers of its existence rarely escaped our concrete fortress hidden within these woods. Within our facility, pushing genetic research into territory ethically gray and often dark, we worked in secret with a purpose shrouded in obscurity. My colleagues, Rosalind Metzler and Tiberius Gannon, and I were just weeks away from a breakthrough that could revolutionize medical science when it all started. Something left from our recent outdoor trials wasn't right. Plants around our facility wilted rapidly. Wildlife fled, and the air grew thick, not with fog, but with an almost tangible sense of foreboding. Have you seen this? Rosalind called to me one morning as I entered the lab. Her voice was tinged not just with curiosity, but a primal caution that made me edge closer to see what had disturbed her usual stoic demeanor. Outside the enclave's high security fences lay carcasses of deer grotesque, as if vital organs had somehow liquefied, their remains almost artistically splayed among the fall leaves. Tiberius chuckled nervously as he joined us at the window. Looks like someone took painting the town red a little bit too literally out there. Before we could reflect further on his dark joke or the scene outside, alarms blared. Violent vibrations shook dust from ceilings a breach in section C where our most unstable subjects resided. I grabbed my firearm issued for emergencies. I never expected to use it within these walls. A frenzy followed. Strobe lights cut through darkness as personnel scrambled toward contingency points. We followed suit until a crashing obstruction and screams halted us mid-step. What now? Tiberius muttered under his breath as we approached cautiously. The crash site revealed twisted metal where sturdy doors once stood, and beyond lay blackness we weren't keen on exploring unarmed and without backup. Yet curiosity led us forward. Rosalind pointed her flashlight beam ahead to reveal deep scratches etched into walls resembling markings of predatory determination rather than human vandalism. An overpowering stench hit us then, the same one lingering on those exteriors where deer lay wasted. As if on cue, from somewhere ahead in the void crept a silhouette, unlike any beast recorded in natural histories, massive yet moving with unnerving precision toward us or toward freedom beyond our underground confines. We didn't question much further, as we bolted back through labyrinthine corridors not designed for fleeing but for locking away secrets and consequences of playing God. Shouts faded behind us along with clanging perhaps too soft to be mistaken for rescue. It was pursuit palpable enough to taste fear without articulating it. Out through a secondary exit we burst into twilight's embrace only marginally less intimidating than what we fled inside a world subtly altered by something capable of rendering organic matter into forms nearly abstract if not for their rootedness in reality's horror. That's when Rosalind grimaced. A cramp? No, pain from unseen forces choosing her among us first for reasons our frayed minds couldn't conjure and reasons amidst escapes adrenaline. Rosalind's steps faltered. I turned to her, saw the stiffness in her posture and the way she clutched her side. We need to keep moving, I said through short breaths. She nodded but struggled to maintain pace. 
We had left our phones back in the lab, thinking the excursion would be brief, uneventful. That error now loomed large. Our only priority was distance between us and that thing. With no means to call for help, we pressed on. We exited the underground facility onto an expanse of unkempt grounds overgrown with wild vegetation. The chain-link fence at the periphery offered a glimmer of hope. Beyond it lay roads and civilization. The creature emerged from the darkness behind us, seven foot at least, tough skin resembling armor, teeth bared in a grotesque imitation of a smile. We ran it pursued, matching our speed with an animalistic grace that chilled my blood. Mark tripped over a root. We heard his scream cut short behind us but didn't dare look back. We reached the fence. Rosalind helped me over before pulling herself up, her strength waning but sufficient. The creature slammed into the barrier moments later, its snarls confirming our narrow escape. On the road now, we flagged down a car, blabbering about an attack until realization dawned on the driver's face, and they sped toward town for help. Cops swarmed the vicinity within hours, yet no sign of Mark or of what pursued us remained, only indecipherable tracks and torn wire where the creature once raged. The story was chalked up to an animal attack, bear or wildcat perhaps, to quell hysteria. Yet those scratches in the walls screamed intelligence, a predator beyond simple categorization, an anomaly defying valid explanation. I never forgot Mark, he became another unspoken casualty, his disappearance noted by few and mourned by even fewer amidst official reluctance to accept such monstrosities lurking in our reality's shadowy recesses. You know that feeling when your stomach sinks because you've realized you forgot something important? That was me, the moment I left my lunch on the kitchen counter. But as a geneticist working at a government facility deep in the Colorado woods, I didn't have the luxury of turning back. Trust me when I say, our work on CRISPR gene editing was far too sensitive for such trivial matters. As I punched in the day's access codes at work, I reflected on our mission's enormity and secrecy. My team led by Dr. Marlo Quinnett and Dr. Rhea Kilborn, were pioneers, rewriting the very blueprints of life. But the air was different that day. Even the usually stoic Dr. Kilborn seemed on edge as she approached me. Turner. Grath. She whispered my name with urgency. We have a situation in containment. Containment was where we held our most volatile experiments ones we hoped would cure diseases or change human resilience forever. As we descended into the bowels of our sight, I felt that same stomach-sinking sensation again. What lay ahead was a grim tableau. One of our researchers crouched over another's body, lifeless and savaged in a manner that defied comprehension. The wound patterns didn't make sense. It wasn't an animal attack nor appeared human-inflicted. The remaining hours unfolded in chaos as we tried to piece together what had happened without alerting anyone to avoid panic within our circle. Protocol dictated silence. We were handler and cleaner of our own messes. During a frenzied search inside the forest for any escaped specimens as twilight settled amongst the trees, we came across something. No, someone terrifyingly familiar and yet impossible. He was too grotesque to be human but possessed a humanoid form, tall and gaunt with elongated limbs that seemed to constrict around him like vines. His eyes, two shimmering pools in the twilight, watched us without emotion or intent but with an eerie intellect. We couldn't alert anyone outside. This thing wasn't supposed to exist. Guns drawn in shaky hands, mine included, gave us little comfort. In broken sequences punctuated by sharp breaths and terse whispers, 
We stalked through underbrush and over creeks after it had disappeared from sight. I've never seen anything like that, panted Dr. Quinnett while wiping his brow, rifle slung over his shoulder. It's unnatural is what it is, I replied intently trying to track any movement ahead. The forest then seemed to conspire against us with its sounds muffled as though absorbing our fear and spitting back silence. As dusk bled into dark night and with each step forward, that entity eluded us expertly, showing just enough for us to follow but not enough for us to catch. Then there was rustling ahead, a rapid shift, a shape launching towards Dr. Kilborn. The creature's form blurred in swift motion as it lunged towards Dr. Kilborn. Before we could react, the thing had closed the distance. In one smooth, terrifying motion, it wrapped its grotesquely long limbs around Kilborn, pulling him into the darkness. His scream ended as abruptly as it started. We froze, unsure if following would lead to our deaths or if turning back would mean abandoning Kilborn to a grim fate. Move back, I whispered, forcing my voice steady. The primal part of my brain screamed at me to run, to scream for help but I knew any sound might attract that thing back towards us. Quinnett nodded in agreement. We edged away from where Kilborn had disappeared, senses strained for any sign of pursuit. We reached a clear area and stopped short. Phone signal, Quinnett mouthed, and we both pulled out our phones in a futile search for bars. Nothing. We were miles from civilization, Reception was non-existent here. We shuffled on for hours until sunlight peeked through the treetops, each step heavy with the knowledge of Kilborn's absence. The safety of daylight brought no relief because that creature was still out there with Kilborn, if he was even alive. Upon returning without him, questions bombarded us. Search parties headed into the forest but found nothing. No tracks beyond our own disturbed path. No signs of struggle where we last saw Kilborn. Just untouched wilderness. The official report concluded as an animal attack, though what kind remained uncertain. A bear, they suggested unconvincingly. Something they could explain to his family, to the public. I left the force not long after couldn't stomach another trek into those woods or the paperwork that hid truths and comfortable lies. The memory haunts every silent moment I find myself alone in darkness. Images of those elongated limbs and Kilborn's abrupt end steal sleep and peace from me. If that creature is what nature hides among those trees, what else remains unseen? Dr. Quinnett went missing days later in the same forest during another search operation for Kilborn. No sign of him either. The woods were closed off to everyone but authorized personnel after that second disappearance. Kilborn's wife held a memorial. He had no grave to visit, and we lamented a good man. A dedicated doctor whose curiosity led him to walk with us towards danger a curiosity that I now shared despite my fear. Images of his last moments replaced former dreams of tranquility amidst nature, peace broken by knowledge too menacing for this world, or at least too menacing for any rational mind to accept without slipping into denial or madness. There are nights I lock all doors and stare at phone screens hoping they might illuminate truths too obscured by shadows or science too limited by its own understanding, because somewhere in that forest breathes life incomprehensible and terror absolute, life that snatched away two men without leaving a trace or chance for saving grace. And so life goes on with one less soul among us and an eternal question mark hanging over those woods over nature itself, and over my mind that struggles each day and night with what happened and what still lurks unseen, unexplained, unstoppable.
This all happened some years ago, back when I was still young, single, and reckless enough to think a solo fishing trip deep into the Everglades was a good idea. Names Riker always had a thing for the outdoors. Maybe it was to escape the stuffy office where I spent most of my days, or maybe just a primal urge to be someplace wild and untouched. My buddy Zeke and I drove down from Orlando, loaded up on supplies and that nervous energy you get before venturing somewhere off the beaten path. Rented a rugged-looking little airboat out near the Shark Valley Visitor Center. The guy who ran the place, toothless, with skin like sun-baked leather, gave us a detailed rundown on routes and safety stuff, and then his eyes narrowed. You boys head out west, he rasped. Don't go north of the Tamimi Trail, hear? Folks go missing out there. Zeke and I exchanged a look. Figured that was local superstition, the kind meant to spook tourists. Morning came, and we were out on the water, that feeling of open space above and around you, the hum of the engine and the constant chirp of insects. The Everglades got in your blood, that weird mix of beauty and something unsettling. Zeke got tired of casting his lure, figured he'd try his luck spearfishing instead. I hung back on the boat, soaking in the scenery, or trying to. There was an odd hush over everything. No bird calls, no rustling in the sawgrass, just silence pressing in. Then I saw movement, in the trees on a distant bank. Took me a moment to process what my eyes were seeing. Tall, way taller than any gator or bear. Hunched over, but even then it towered over the cypress. Matted gray-brown fur and a long, sinuous tail flicking behind it. It moved too smooth to be an animal, more like a shadow slipping between the trees. Before I could do more than gape, I heard a yell from Zeke. Sound cut off sharp. I whipped my head around and saw the spot where he'd been waiting was just empty, churned up water and a discarded spear gun floating on the surface. Swearing, I fumbled for the pistol I'd stashed under the seat, but it was too late. The boat lurched violently, something slamming into the side. I went sprawling as the motor died. That's when I got a proper look at the thing. It reared up over the side of the boat, dripping swamp water. Massive was an understatement. Had to be seven, maybe eight feet tall standing upright. Its muzzle looked unnaturally long, teeth crowding its open jaws. The eyes were the worst part. That flat, yellow, predatory gleam, no animal I'd ever seen had eyes like that. Panic fueled me. I fired a shot. It echoed across the swamp, useless against a creature like that. It snarled, a guttural rasp, and lunged. My memories hazy after that, scrambling onto the far side of the boat, it trying to reach around, claws ripping through fiberglass. Somehow, I got the engine restarted, gunned it, and went careening away. Didn't stop until I was back on the main channel, heart pounding like a drumbeat in my ears. The other tourists probably thought I was mad when I stumbled off the boat, babbling about monsters. Zeke was gone, without a trace. When the search and rescue crews went out, they didn't find any sign of him, not a thing. A few nights later, back in civilization, I started digging. Turns out the old legends about the Everglades weren't all tall tales. Turns out, the Seminole whispered stories about a thing called the Stikini, a spirit of hunger, twisted and ravenous. The descriptions fit what I saw down to those damn eyes. I never went back to the Everglades after that. Sometimes I swear I catch a whiff of that swamp rot odor in the city, like it's following me. And on nights when the shadows dance and the city sounds fade, I wonder about Zeke. Part of me is a fool who thinks maybe, somehow, he survived. That he's out there, fending off the stickini with his bare hands. The other part of me 
The rational, terrified part, knows he's probably gone. But sometimes you hear reports on the news, half glimpsed in the corner of your eye, missing hikers, bodies found torn to pieces where no animal could have reached. And then that image burns in my brain, the creature from the swamp, the hunger in its eyes, and the faint, lingering hope that it wasn't Zeke it found that day. A few years passed. I tried to bury it all, the Everglades, Zeke, that monstrous thing in the shadows. Got married, steady job, the whole picket fence suburban dream. Figured that chapter of my life was over. But things have a way of creeping back up on you, especially out there in the wilds. Last fall, my wife surprised me with a weekend getaway at a fancy lodge tucked away near the big Cypress National Preserve. She thought it would be romantic, nature trails, canoe rides, the works. Little did she know. First day there, I found myself on one of those guided swamp walks, the ranger droning on about native flora and fauna. Something about that dense greenery, the buzzing insects, and the ever-present smell of decay gnawed at me. Then, through a gap in the trees, I saw it, a half-submerged pile of bones, bleached white by the sun. Not gator or deer bones. They looked almost human. That familiar prickle of fear snaked down my spine. I lagged behind the group, pretended to take photos. When they moved on, I crept closer, heart in my throat. The skull was crushed, jaw twisted at an unnatural angle. And in the soft mud nearby, a single massive paw print. I didn't say anything. Not to my wife, not to park staff. We left the next day, me faking a stomach bug. What would I have even told them? That a legendary monster was on the loose? They'd have locked me up in the psych ward. And that's my life now. There's always that low-level hum of dread under the surface of normalcy. Sometimes when I walk the dog at night, I imagine the gleam of yellow eyes in the bushes. Every rustle of leaves in the wind makes me jump. My own backyard feels smaller, less safe, because I know what lurks beyond the edges of civilization. Sometimes I look up missing person reports, searching for names from the Everglades. Every unidentified body gnawed upon by some unknown predator fuels the sick, twisted certainty inside me. I check the old stories, see if some new legend has risen, whispered among the locals in the same way the Seminole told tales of the Stikini. Maybe they've got a new name for it, a new word for the fear. Doesn't matter what you call it, that thing's still out there. And part of me, a reckless thrill-seeking part one thought I'd long outgrown, knows I haven't seen the last of it. It happened a few years back, on a trip down south to visit my sister. She'd settled near the Everglades, one of those nature-loving types— figured I could use some fresh air after too many hours hunched at my desk. Name's Bryson, web developer by day, video game junkie by night. Not exactly the rugged outdoorsman type, but hey, family. My first mistake was agreeing to a camping trip. We weren't venturing deep, thank God, just an overnight at one of the designated sites in the Fakahatchee Strand Preserve. Even so, as we set up the tent, the air hanging thick and humid, every rustle in the undergrowth made me jumpy. Night fell fast. The Everglades got noisy then, crickets going at it full blast, the splash of unseen critters in the water. Sis started a campfire, and we roasted marshmallows, tried to laugh away the prickling unease settling over me. Eventually, she headed to the tent— leaving me to tend the dying embers. Then I heard it not a rustle, not a splash, but a different sort of sound. Like heavy footsteps, slow and deliberate, 
and the swampy ground off to my left. Just the gator, I told myself. Gulp. Probably. But gators didn't sound like that. This was weighty, thudding. Too big. I edged closer to the fire, grabbed a sturdy-looking branch. Then I saw it, just beyond the circle of firelight. A silhouette, hunched but still massive even like that, rising out of the sawgrass. It took a step forward, and my breath hitched. Fur, patchy and ragged, clinging to its form. Too tall to be a bear, and that muzzle, elongated and narrow. And the eyes, even at this distance, those dull yellow eyes seemed to gleam. My body reacted before my brain was fully online. I didn't yell for my sis, didn't try to put out the fire. Just turned tail and bolted, branches whipping at my face, the pounding of my own heart almost drowning out the thing's footsteps behind me. Didn't stop till I hit the road, gasping for air, legs on fire. Somehow, I found my way back to the campsite, sis scrambling from the tent, confused and worried. I babbled something about a wild hog, anything to avoid the word monster. Packed up that tent in near record time, leaving the campfire smoldering. Didn't sleep a wink in my sister's tiny apartment that night. Next morning, over pancakes I didn't eat, she hesitantly asked if I saw something out there. Told her again about the hog, but I could see she didn't buy it. There's stories around here, she said, her voice low. Old stories about something out there. Yeah, well, stories are just stories, right? I tried for a laugh, but it sounded weak. The rest of that trip was a blur. Somehow made it through family dinners and obligatory tourist stuff, that feeling of unseen eyes on my back never fading. Back home, I dove headfirst into research, fueled by sleepless nights and the persistent tang of swamp rot in my nostrils that followed me everywhere. Turned out, the Seminole called it the Nelusophilea, the long black being. Some kind of twisted spirit, born of starvation and desperation. Tried to dismiss it, write it off as superstition, but those eyes lingered in my memory. The weight of those footsteps. I'd felt it, seen it, whatever it was. Real or not, that thing in the swamp had been coming for me. I spent weeks after that with every light in the apartment on, flinching at shadows, my usual video game marathons replaced by scrolling through blurry Bigfoot sighting photos and message boards full of cryptozoology theories. Pathetic, really. Then came the news report. A wildlife photographer, missing in the Fakahatchee. They found his camera later smashed, memory card corrupted. Except for one photo, barely visible through the distortion. A patch of sawgrass, a flash of ragged fur, and a single glowing yellow eye staring straight into the lens. I never went back to the Everglades. Sis, bless her heart, doesn't bring it up anymore, but I see it in her eyes sometimes. The worry, the question of whether her city slicker brother finally snapped. Maybe I did a little. Works an escape. I stick to familiar websites well lit subways, the virtual worlds of my video games. But some nights, the air gets heavy, smells like stagnant water, and the sound of the water heater kicking in morphs into something else. Thudding footsteps, slow and relentless. And I wonder if the Nelusophilae only hunts in the swamp, or if these concrete jungles have their own dark corners, their own unseen predators, waiting for the lost and the lonely to stumble in. A year or so later, I went hiking solo. Figured I needed to face my fears, get back out in nature, somewhere familiar, somewhere safe. Local state park, well-maintained trails, nothing like the wilds of Florida. Still, my heart pounded double time as I set out, gaze twitching towards every patch of dense growth. Turns out, Fear doesn't follow state boundaries. 
I was deep into the woods by the time dusk hit, the undergrowth closing in, sunlight barely filtering through the canopy above. Saw movement a few yards off the trail, in the shadows. My breath hitched. Frozen, I waited. Maybe just a deer. It stepped out into a patch of weak sunlight. Fur dark and patchy, but not the smooth coat of a deer. A long, lean body with an unnatural loping gait. That damn elongated muzzle, and the eyes. There was no mistaking those glowing eyes, even in the twilight. I turned and ran, not even caring about the trail anymore crashing through the woods with only blind instinct guiding me. It was behind me, heard the rustling in the dead leaves, the snapping of twigs, closer and closer. Tripped, sprawled face first in the dirt. Heard it snarl, a low rasping sound that made my blood run cold. Scrambled to my feet, kept going, heart pounding a frantic tattoo against my ribs burst out of the tree line and onto a field, collapsing on the ground and gasping like a fish out of water. It didn't follow. I sat there till the sky was full of stars, listening to the night sounds, the crickets and frogs blissfully unaware of the monsters that might be lurking in the darkness. I knew then that it wasn't over. That fear, the feeling of being watched, of being hunted, it was in me now, in my bones. Maybe it had been all along. These days I live even smaller. Take medication for the anxiety that comes in waves, the nightmares that still wake me screaming in a cold sweat. Sometimes, when that swamp rot smell hits me on the most crowded of city streets, when a shadow in the corner of my eye resolves into just a flicker of light, I hear those footsteps, feel those eyes boring into me. The Nalissophilia. I don't know if it's a beast, a spirit, or some twisted manifestation of the primal fears buried deep within us all. All I know is that somewhere out there, in the shadows on the edge of the known world, it's waiting. And I know, without a doubt, that one day my fear will find me again. It was merely minutes after the sun dipped beyond the horizon when Clyde raised his hand, signaling for me to halt. Hank, listen, he whispered. I strained my ears and caught a subtle, yet out-of-place sound echoing through the forest. As a search and rescue officer for the United States Forest Service, I'd been part of countless missions in remote areas like this. I'm Hank Garfield, by the way. This time... We were tasked with locating a group of missing hikers in Dead Horse Valley, an eerie-sounding location, but believe it or not, that's its real name. The valley is known for its dense vegetation and rugged terrain, not exactly an ideal place to get lost. The other officers on our team fanned out while Clyde and I moved towards the source of the sound, our senses razor-sharp. The moon cast long shadows through the tree branches as we maneuvered carefully past gnarled roots and slippery rocks. Why'd the chicken cross the playground? Clyde whispered, attempting to lighten the mood with a corny joke. To get to the other slide. We both snickered quietly before refocusing on our task. Slithering closer, we spotted something disturbing up ahead. Brutal swathes of crimson painted the ground around what appeared to be remains. We approached cautiously, realizing these grisly remnants didn't resemble any animal attack we'd ever encountered in our careers. Chills crept up my spine as I studied the carnage before us. Even though logic told me there was no way it could be humanly possible, this looked eerily like someone had used their own hands to tear apart whatever creature had once been here. I've never seen anything like this, admitted Clyde, his face somber and vigilant. Hastily snapping some photos for evidence, we continued onward with hushed voices and heightened senses. 
We pressed forward until suddenly another unsettling noise shattered the silence. It resonated like a guttural growl, accompanied by the unmistakable sound of snapping bones. Crouching behind a nearby boulder, we scanned the vicinity for any sign of movement. A gut-wrenching stench grew stronger with each passing moment as our nerves stretched taut. From the darkness emerged something beyond human comprehension, a monstrous creature that was equal parts beast and nightmare. Its hulking form stood eye to eye with the treetops, its body covered in coarse, matted fur. Claws longer than my forearms scraped the ground, while its warped face featured jagged teeth and malevolent eyes filled with bloodthirst. Frozen in terror, we watched as this thing tossed an annihilated carcass aside, sniffing the air like it was hunting for its next meal. My heartbeat pounded against my ribcage, threatening to betray our hiding place. It was painfully clear there would be no reinforcements in time to save us from this abomination. In a desperate attempt to divert its attention, I lobbed a rock as far away from us as possible. The creature immediately snapped its head towards the noise before lumbering off in pursuit. Seizing the opportunity, we burst into action and ran for our lives, knowing full well that escape would not come easily. As we sprinted towards safety, I couldn't shake the feeling of being stalked with ruthless intent. Every twig snap felt like a death sentence as we zigzagged through trees and stumbled over obstacles hoping our surroundings would offer some protection from whatever fate awaited us behind each rustling bush or looming shadow. We continued our frantic escape, having little time to think about anything other than survival. The deafening sounds of the monstrous creature's pursuit filled the air, and we could sense its unrelenting hunger driving it closer and closer to us. We need to find help! I shouted, gasping for breath as we ran. But there's no one around here for miles, my companion replied. We're on our own. Suddenly, we stumbled upon an old, abandoned cabin. With no other choice present, and hoping that it would provide at least a temporary shelter from the beast, we rushed inside, shutting the door tightly behind us. We frantically searched for objects that might be useful in defending ourselves. Rummaging through the debris and dust-covered furniture, we found an old hunting rifle. But no ammunition, hardly any consolation, but it was better than nothing. As we barricaded ourselves within the cabin, we hoped our foe hadn't caught our scent. We could still hear its growls nearby but couldn't tell if it was getting closer or further away. Without thinking, my companion picked up a flare gun from a nearby drawer. Maybe we can scare it off with this, he exclaimed. Despite the slim chances of success weighing heavily upon us, the plan seemed like our best option at hand. Taking a deep breath and muttering a silent prayer, my companion opened the door just enough for us to aim the flare gun at the creature. The roar of the flare gun erupted in the night air as my companion pulled the trigger. A bright and burning red light pierced through the darkness. It was as if time slowed as we watched it fly directly toward our hunter. As luck would have it, the flare struck the creature squarely in its menacing face. Instantly, its fur ignited in an explosion of fire. The creature let out an ear-splitting shriek of pain as it furiously attempted to extinguish the flames that consumed its body. With the abomination momentarily distracted, we seized our chance. Escaping from the confines of the cabin, we dashed through the woods with a renewed sense of urgency. As we finally reached a small town at the edge of the woods, utterly exhausted and covered in dirt, we stumbled upon a local sheriff's station. We rushed in to report our terrifying encounter, hoping that our ordeal was finally over. The officers listened to our account, their faces reflecting doubt and disbelief. But upon examining our physical state and considering our sincere fear, they agreed to investigate. A search party set out the next day to look into our claims and search for any evidence of this monstrous being that had stalked us through the night. Curiosity got the better of us, 
so we join them in the hopes of unmasking our tormentor once and for all. As we trekked through the woods, all that remained of our former pursuer was a pile of charred fur and bones. The authorities collected what was left as evidence. The monster may be gone now, but the memory of that horrific night haunts us every time we hear an unexplainable noise or see something moving in the shadows. One thing is certain, we both will forever hold on to the lesson that there are creatures lurking within this world not meant for human understanding and sometimes it's best just to run from them. I wiped the sweat from my brow as I descended down the trail. My name is Max Hartford, and I work as a search and rescue officer for the United States Forest Service. It was just another routine day at work, or so I thought. I found myself patrolling a dense forest in eastern Oregon, an isolated area known as the Eagle Cap Wilderness. The spruces, pines, and firs stood tall around me, their leaves gently rustling in the breeze. A squirrel scampered across my path before disappearing up a tree trunk. My boots crunched on the dry leaves beneath me as I continued down the quiet trail. Max, have you seen anything unusual yet? asked Karen through my handheld radio. Karen is my co-worker who patrols another sector of this territory. Our radios were our lifelines in these vast forests. Nah, not today, I replied casually. A squirrel ran past me earlier. It was pretty cute. I'll keep you updated if anything pops up. I continued making my way through the forest when something caught my attention. A nearby grove had been ravished. The trees bore claw marks and some of their bark had been stripped away. It seemed like an animal had caused this damage, a particularly large one. Curiosity peaked. I cautiously approached the destroyed grove to examine it more closely. As I did so, I noticed deep tracks gouged into the earth that led in a seemingly random direction. Whatever had caused this wreckage was definitely not your typical woodland creature. Suddenly, an overpowering stench invaded my nostrils. It smelled like rotting flesh mixed with gasoline-soaked rags. Overwhelmed by the smell, I covered my nose with my hand but couldn't resist following the tracks deeper into the woods. The sun dipped below the horizon, casting dark shadows through the trees. My radio crackled to life once again. Max, we got reports of a missing hiker. Something about an abandoned campsite nearby. Can you head over there and check it out? Sure thing. I replied, my heart pounding with the thought of what I might find at this campsite. As I made my way to the location, the stench grew stronger, forcing me to breathe through my mouth to avoid gagging. Arriving at the campsite, I could see that it had been completely ravished. It seemed that whatever creature had left behind those tracks had struck here too. Torn tents and broken cookware lay strewn across the site. I approached a collapsed tent and noticed blood splattered on the shredded fabric alongside similar claw marks to those found at the grove. My instincts told me that this was no ordinary animal attack. Something unnatural was stalking these woods. I hesitated before contacting Karen because there weren't many jokes that could lighten a situation like this one. Nevertheless, I tried. Hey Karen, you think we need one of those bear-proof tents? Her response suggested that humor might be misplaced for now. This isn't really the time for jokes. Max, stay safe out there. Adrenaline coursed through my veins as I resumed following those tracks deeper into the dark forest. The moon provided faint light just as a guttural growl echoed from somewhere ahead. With my flashlight in hand and my pistol at the ready, I stepped into a small clearing. The creature stood there. Massive, fierce, and unlike anything I had ever seen before. It was quadrupedal with matted fur covering its muscular body. Hundreds of serrated teeth filled its wide jaws. The creature's eyes locked onto mine, 
emanating a primal intelligence. At that moment, a voice in my head urged me to flee. However, my legs refused to cooperate, frozen in fear. The creature took a step towards me, and I managed to gather my wits enough to speak into the radio. Karen, I need backup. There's a large creature here that might be responsible for the attack on the hiker. Send help now. She sensed the urgency in my voice and responded quickly. I'm sending help your way. Max, stay safe. My heart was pounding as the creature advanced closer. Seeing that there was no other option, I fired a shot at it. The bullet hit its shoulder, causing it to momentarily recoil but not inflicting serious injury. It snarled before lunging at me furiously. Realizing I had provoked the beast and put myself in more danger, I dashed towards where I came from, leaving behind my flashlight due to sheer panic, and sprinted through the woods. The sounds of growling and snapping branches followed me closely, as did the heavy strides of the relentless creature behind. My lungs burned as I pushed on through sheer desperation. Somewhere in the darkness of night, I stumbled upon an old cabin. Bursting through the door and slamming it shut behind me, I frantically searched for a makeshift barricade, finding an abandoned dresser to block the entrance. As I wedged it in place, the creature slammed into the door with monstrous force, shaking the cabin as it tried mercilessly to break through. Finally, sirens echoed off in the distance giving me solace knowing that help was on its way. But the creature's unyielding assault continued relentlessly outside. When police arrived on scene with sirens blazing, they opened fire on the beast attacking our cabin causing it to shriek in terror and retreat back into the darkness. As the officers assessed the damage, a disheveled cabin, destroyed campsite, and scattered belongings, I couldn't help but mourn the hiker who fell victim to that fierce creature. In the aftermath of it all, I was grateful for Karen sending help promptly and for surviving that horrible night. Investigators and park officials worked diligently to track down the creature, hoping to protect others from its brutal attacks. Though I always knew that the remote outdoors could be dangerous, nothing could have prepared me for that encounter with a vicious predator. The memory of that night serves as a constant reminder to myself and others about the unpredictability and savagery of nature. I remember stepping off of the bus in Broken Bow, Nebraska, a small town you won't find on any tourist list. I had traveled there to enjoy some peace away from my hectic job as a financial analyst. My name is Saul Summersby, and I had hoped for a little solitude to clear my tormented soul. I never could have guessed what awaited me there. As I settled into my room at the local inn, I struck up a conversation with an elderly man named Ezra Pritchard. He shared stories of the town's mysterious disappearances that date back generations. At first, I found it hard to believe, but he insisted there was truth in these tall tales. One evening, as the sun cast golden rays across the vast cornfields, I decided to venture out with Ezra's dog, Rufus, for a peaceful walk. We meandered along an old dirt path bordered by tall trees that enveloped us in eerie shadows. It wasn't long before we stumbled upon an old house obscured from sight by ivy and overgrown shrubs. Curiosity got the better of me, and we crept closer. The wooden door creaked open ever so slightly as we stepped inside the dilapidated structure. The eerie atmosphere sent shivers down my spine despite my skepticism. The dim light seeping through dusty windows illuminated old photos sprawled on the dust-laden floor, their faces twisted in pain or fear. Suddenly Rufus jerked on his leash and bolted toward the basement door with remarkable intent. Upon opening it, we found ourselves engulfed in darkness and descended into the now suffocating air of the cellar. 
The moment our eyes adjusted to obscurity, I recoiled in horror at what lay before me, bones and carcasses scattered across the stone floor like leftovers of some horrendous feast. Before I could wrap my head around our perturbing discovery, a blood-curdling howl echoed through the night, and we were immediately thrust into panic. Rufus scrambled to exit, while I fumbled to find my phone in my pocket. As I dialed the emergency number, the chilling growls approached, and it became clear that this was no mere animal. The line rang without response, so without other options, I rummaged through the basement's debris. In a tense moment of providence, I discovered a shotgun among the rubble. Just as the creature's grotesque form emerged from the shadows, I raised my newfound armament in panic desperation. With rotting flesh clinging to its gaunt body and eyes that harbor no soul, this nightmare incarnate lunged toward us. I pulled the trigger, but only a pathetic click emerged. The gun was empty. In blind panic, we stumbled back up the stairs with haste as the creature reached out with claws that glistened in dim moonlight. With no protection between us and it, Rufus snapped viciously at the monster's outstretched limb. The creature recoiled at Rufus's courageous defiance, yet its hateful glare remained fixed upon our panicked retreat. Our race against death led us through the once-adorned halls and into their grim museum of suffering. As we burst onto the porch of the forsaken house, with claws tearing through rotting floorboards behind us, I shouted in terror for anyone who could hear me. The town's residents soon responded with rustle and distant shouts of concern, but not before an unbearable pain surged through my leg. The pain in my leg was unbearable, as I realized the creature had managed to land a devastating blow. I fell onto the ground, clutching my bleeding leg, and watching in horror as the townspeople charged toward the creature, armed with whatever they could find, pitchforks, axes, hammers. With a guttural snarl, the creature faced its newfound challengers. It swiped at them ferociously, its claws finding purchase in flesh and bone alike. Screams of agony echoed through the night air as more people fell victim to this terrifying beast. But despite the losses, the townspeople didn't waver. Through sheer determination and brute force, they managed to drive the creature back into the darkness of the woods. At first, I thought it would never retreat until everyone lay dead. But when it finally disappeared beyond the blackness of night upon a chorus of terrified gasps and exasperated breaths, I was helped by mourning neighbors who stared in sad disbelief at their fallen friends turned into victims by this unimaginable nightmare. My leg was quickly bandaged, but the cool touch of cloth couldn't relieve my pain nor obscuring memories of witnessing gruesome deaths on that forsaken porch. Days later, an older man dressed in formal clothing appeared at my door to inquire about what transpired that horrific night. He introduced himself as a university professor specializing in cultural studies and anthropology who had heard about our incident. Though not one to frighten villagers with tales of folklore or dark legends beyond their expected boundaries within academia or cultural circles, specific details from our experience caught his interest. He asked if he could examine my wounds carefully before proceeding back to photographs taken of our attacker's gruesome handiwork, his eyes betraying an unspoken understanding instead of vacant horror observed within candlelit streets where whispers scour lower than stone walls horse-drawn curtains hide. He continually scribbled down notes upon battered paper pieces before pausing to explain his thoughts with quivering words. The creature you all encountered, it appears to be a being from our ancestral folklore, he said hesitantly, losing himself in thought. The traits, the attacks, the insatiable hunger for destruction, they all align with what our ancestors called the Yilika, a creature born of darkness and misery. The professor proceeded to share more about this terrifying beast's origins and alleged sightings over the centuries 
even as I struggled to grasp how such a creature could exist in the first place. The legend spoke of an ancient curse placed on Yulika generations ago by an enigmatic woman who sought vengeance against her village's tormentor using mystic powers that have become blurred with time and retelling. The sobering reality left a lingering chill. The fact that what we once considered mere tales told before crackling fires and under cooking pots were not only real but hauntingly present. After several conversations and exchanging information, the professor departed to further study his findings and search for possible ways to end this lurking abomination before it hunts again. Life gradually returned to its regular rhythm but burdened beneath heavy shadows cast on grieving families by merciless moonlight and restless memories. Months passed. Changing leaves colored horizon as fading memories became entwined alongside seasonal vibrancy never erasing unforgiving grasps upon shivering hearts feeling cold even within warm embraces or laughter close family fireplaces. But when mutilated bodies started piling up once more on borderlands between slumbering towns where echoes spread far wider than sinister whispers managed unaided, we knew that our nightmare wasn't truly over. People trembled in fear knowing Yulika lurked in shadows, unseen as fear painted their every step through sunlit paths preparing dread stretches darkness laid stretched across weather-worn paths carrying echoes born tragedy held firmly within panicked heartbeats reaching beyond days and awaiting cursed reunion night-touched horrors. I still can't forget that fateful encounter how it forever changed our lives turned inside out by creatures of folklore emerging to haunt our every waking moment. And I know, deep in my heart, that the nightmare isn't truly over, for as long as Yulika roams the dark corners of the world, we'll always live in fear of its return. I couldn't believe it. I had finally found the perfect spot to go camping. I was so excited to tell my best friend, Octavian Lachlan, about this isolated retreat in the thick woods of Eureka, California. As an avid outdoor enthusiast, I felt my heart leap at the thought of breathing the pine-scented air and sleeping beneath a canopy of stars. Little did I know that the adventure awaiting us would be far more terrifying than exciting. As we loaded our gear into our trusty pickup truck, I reminisced about my military upbringing and how it pushed me outside my comfort zone, sparking my enduring love for adventure. Despite the many tests of my courage overseas, I thought I'd met every challenge nature could throw at me. How wrong I had been. We drove through twisted roads lined with giant redwoods, reaching deeper into nature's cradle as phone's signal became increasingly weaker. The vanishing bars on our phones signaled isolation, something both Octavian and I eagerly anticipated after long months spent in our mundane office jobs. At last, we set up camp at the edge of a misshrouded lake, feeling satisfied with our progress that day. We shared a hearty meal beside the fire and cracked jokes about our colleagues back in Silicon Valley over foamy beers. As darkness set in and muffled laughter turned to yawns, we retreated into our tents for a long-awaited good night's sleep. Out here, where city light didn't bleed into the night sky, we were granted a front-row seat to one of nature's most dazzling performances— clusters of stars that twinkled like diamonds against an inky black canvas above us. Just as sleep began to claim us, a haunting howl echoed through the forest, stopping us both cold in our tracks. The sound was close enough to raise goose bumps along with hairs and blazing ends across our arms and necks. Octavian's eyes grew wide, and I knew he must be thinking the same thing as me. We both unzipped our tents and scanned the woods with our flashlights, unable to shake an eerie sensation that something more than just curiosity had drawn us into this refuge. We decided we couldn't spend the night cowering in our tents, 
while an unknown threat lurked nearby. Armed with pocket knives and our tactical training, we slowly crept through the forest, seeking the origin of the strange howls that continued to echo ominously through the trees. As minutes turned into hours, we stumbled upon a set of odd tracks engraved into the moist ground. They appeared to belong to some kind of quadruped, but one like nothing either of us had seen before. The tracks led us deeper into the woods until we reached a clearing where we were met with a chilling scene. The carcass of a deer lay mutilated before us, its bones picked clean and arranged in an unnerving pattern across the ground. Whatever had committed the gruesome act was no mere animal. It possessed something beyond primal instincts, something akin to twisted intelligence. We clawed our way back toward camp, mindful of any sudden movements or rustling leaves. The howls drew nearer, their feral intensity signaling something wild, perhaps even evil, roamed these shaded forests by night. We knew it was near as moonlight glinted off its massive, scaled back stalking among shadows cast by monstrously clawed feet. Caught between retreat and confrontation within this environment that once embodied freedom for us both, our once certain steps now faltered beneath the echoing howls as they intensified to become cacophonous roars. With adrenaline coursing through our veins and shaking hands gripping knives tight, Octavian and I steeled ourselves against whatever fate awaited us. Our hearts pounded deafeningly as if challenging whatever primal beast now stalked us in turn, a beast which seemed to answer in kind, its roars ever brimming with untold rage and insatiable hunger for these two erstwhile intruders. As Octavian and I stood frozen in fear, I noticed a faint trail of ashes among the trees. The creature had apparently been careless, leaving a trail that could lead us to its home. Octavian, always the braver of the two of us, began following the trail while I hesitated. After seeing the deer carcass and hearing those dreadful howls, I feared what other horrors awaited us. Come on, Octavian shouted back at me. We might find help or at least get an idea of what we're dealing with. But what if it leads to more danger? I muttered under my breath. Despite my reluctance, I followed him. We soon stumbled upon an abandoned cabin amid the twisted trees. The door had been ripped off its hinges and monstrous claw marks adorned the walls. Inside, we found remnants of earlier victims, hikers and campers who had suffered fates just as terrible as that deer. Underneath piles of torn clothing and personal belongings, Octavian discovered a worn journal. This was clearly someone's attempt at researching the creature that terrorized these woods. As he leafed through blood-soaked pages, filled with desperate attempts to identify this nightmarish beast, we started to feel a strange connection to the person who had written this journal, another unfortunate victim who shared our helpless fear. Anxiety building up within me, I grabbed the journal from Octavian's hands and flipped through it frantically. There had to be something in here that would help us. It turned out our gruesome adversary was a creature from local folklore that they called Vulcasis, known for its brutality and hunger for human flesh. And if that wasn't bad enough, this demon-like monster was almost impossible to escape. We can't stay here. I whispered urgently to Octavian. We have to try and get away. Realizing just how dire our predicament was getting each passing minute, we decided to follow the trail of ashes, hoping it would lead us out of these cursed woods. Sudden crashing sounds echoed from behind us. I turned and saw the Velcasus charging towards us. Its massive, scaled body lunged in our direction with terrifying speed, fangs gnashing and eyes ablaze with hatred. In that instant, my instincts took over, and I yelled at Octavian to run. We sprinted through the forest snaking roots, desperate for an escape route. As we reached a cliff edge with nowhere else to turn, we were cornered. 
The nightmarish creature drew closer and closer, its growls ever more deafening. With no other option left, I screamed out for help. The beast halted momentarily as if it too felt this primal desperation that tore through the air. Just then, a bright flash of lightning illuminated the dark sky, followed by a thunderous boom. At that very moment, several villagers wielding torches emerged from behind the trees. Drawn by my screams and guided by the storm's lightning, they had come to save us. The Velcasus recoiled from the light and heat of their torches. It knew it was outnumbered and outmatched by these humans who refused to fall victim to its reign of terror any longer. Realizing it couldn't win this time, the creature fled into the darkness howling one last guttural cry as a sickening promise of future revenge before vanishing from sight. The villagers helped us back to their small settlement. Bruised and battered but thankful for their aid, Octavian and I decided it was time to leave those cursed woods behind. As we said our farewells to the brave people who had saved us from certain death at the hands of Valcasus, I glanced one last time at the journal in my trembling hands. In honor of those who had unwittingly faced the same terror as us and lost their lives, I knew that my mission was to spread the word, educating others about this horrifying legend. With a heavy heart, I handed the journal to the village elder. He nodded solemnly, understanding that I'd entrusted him with keeping the town vigilant against any future threat from Valcasus. As Octavian and I left that place far behind us, we knew we'd never forget the horrifying experience we shared. While we may have escaped the clutches of Valcasus that fateful night, its gruesome legacy would haunt our memories for the rest of our days. I stepped out onto the porch, stretching my arms and inhaling the crisp air. Ah, uh, finally some peace and quiet, I thought. My name's Elton Graverly, and I teach history at Mendelton High School down in Louisiana. I had been craving for this vacation to White Pine Creek Reserve for months. The cabin I rented was cozy, one bedroom, a kitchen and a small living area with a wood stove nestled amongst towering pine trees. There were no other cabins nearby, just how I wanted it. The perfect place to unwind after a long school year full of rowdy teenagers. Instead of catching up on sleep like most people would do on their vacation, I decided to hike towards the creek right away. As I was putting on my hiking boots, I cracked a joke to myself. Teacher by day, nature explorer by weekend, Elton Graverly can do it all. Chuffed with my wittiness, I looked at my reflection in a small hallway mirror just as Mrs. Kriegman's voice echoed in my mind. Walking in these woods alone? There might be serial killers lurking around. Her paranoia always made our colleagues laugh. A mile into the hike, the woods rustled as animals scurried away from my footsteps. Out of nowhere, I stumbled upon what seemed to be an old campsite. Burned logs were scattered around the extinguished fire pit as if someone tried to frantically put off the fire. Torn clothes and crushed bags lay strewn nearby. If that wasn't weird enough, there were no footprints leading to or leaving the campsite. Feeling uneasy and puzzled, I couldn't help but think about Mrs. Kriegman's words. Maybe there was some truth to her paranoid fears. Trying not to overthink it, I continued with my hike but stored that grisly scene to share with her later. The further I walked, the darker the skies seemed to become. The once clear babbling of the creek dwindled until it became eerily silent. As sunlight filtered through the dense trees, Casting odd shadows on my path, tension built within me. This was not how my serene retreat was supposed to feel. Then suddenly, something caught my attention just at the edge of my peripheral vision. I turned to see what it was but there was nothing, 
just an odd-shaped rock jutting out from a mound of leaves. Nothing in this place seemed to make sense. The abandoned campsite, the eerie silence, and now this peculiar rock formation convinced me that it was time to return to the cabin. On my way back, various images played in my head, scenarios with monsters or slashers waiting for me around each trunk. Even though my mind conjured up these frightful thoughts, I knew deep down that they were unreasonable. When I finally reached the cabin, I felt relief flood through me as if I'd crossed into some kind of safe zone. Then something moved near my periphery again, but this time had ventured too close to ignore. I saw it in full view, a creature unlike anything I could have imagined. It stood on two legs like a man but had elongated arms like those reaching for an embrace. Its skin resembled a snake's hide and shone an unnatural sheen in the sun's rays. Its eyes gleamed an abyssal black that seemed to bore right through me. It lifted one arm, gently turning its head as if gauging my reaction. In that moment, all logic and reason escaped my trembling body. Nobody had encounters like this. There had always been explanations for strange things witnessed by anyone who ventured into natural reserves like this. Animals scavenging abandoned campsites or periodolia causing people to see things in shadows that weren't really there. Any rational explanation for what was happening to me vanished as the creature lunged. In sheer disbelief, I stumbled backwards, my fight-or-flight instincts triggered as I struggled to find a footing. My mind spun as every possible scenario I had imagined over the course of my hike now seemed plausible. A blood-curdling scream broke the silence of those once peaceful woods. The realization that it was coming from me was just as terrifying. As the creature closed in, its grotesque features distorted by another primal scream. Desperate, I attempted to distance myself from the creature by clumsily stomping through the underbrush. It relentlessly pursued me, the sound of its gnarled, reptilian limbs snapping branches and rustling leaves growing louder and more frenzied as it gained ground. As I pushed through the thicket, my focus remained entirely on survival. Reason eluded me, and instead of calling for help, if only to provide a sense of solace amid the encroaching madness. I could only concentrate on evading this terrifying abomination. Suddenly, I tripped on a protruding root and fell to the ground with a painful impact. The creature drew closer, and I knew that I couldn't keep running. Knowing that defending myself against this beast was likely impossible, I screamed for help at the top of my lungs. My calls echoed through the dense woods for what felt like hours but was likely mere minutes, prayers to anyone or anything that would listen. The creature paused briefly before emitting an ungodly hiss in response to my cries. Its horrific expression remained fixed upon me. There was no empathy or understanding in those dark, soulless eyes. A faint glimmer of hope emerged through the terror as distant voices rushed toward me. Heard over the panic yelps of my pursuer, two hikers happened to be nearby and were now approaching rapidly after hearing my screams. The unexpected arrival of potential reinforcements caught the attention of my assailant. Its head darted back and forth between me and their approaching footsteps. The voices grew louder and just as my rescuers emerged from their hiding places in the tree lean, our nightmare lunged once more in an attempt to deliver one final act of grisly violence upon its intended quarry. It managed to reach me before they did but lost balance, and tumbled off into a nearby ravine during its frenzied assault. My would-be saviors gasped in horror as they took in what had just unfolded. For a few precious moments— Everyone remained motionless, attempting to process the traumatic events that had taken place. With the lurking terror gone for now, we didn't waste any time getting far from its potential return. As we ran through the woods together, I quickly filled them in on the danger they had arrived just in time to witness. 
Their confusion mirrored mine, but all any of us wanted was to be out of that forest. Eventually, we reached a ranger station and explained our ordeal. It was evident that the rangers could hardly believe our tale but had no choice but to investigate due to the gravity of our claims. Later, during their search of the area where I'd encountered the beasts, they found something unnatural, shed scales and tufts of coarse hair unlike anything they had ever seen before in those woods. Though this evidence supported my story and caused concern among personnel, identifying the creature proved elusive for even experienced specialists. As unsettling as my experience had been, life continued. The forest was put under strict surveillance as authorities tried to make sense of what happened, but no solid answers came forth. The creature vanished as enigmatically as it appeared, leaving only fear in its wake. Though I was grateful for having survived my ordeal with the creature, who would remain an enigma forevermore, unanswered questions nod at me and cause sleepless nights laden with unyielding dread. My thoughts turned occasionally to the possibility that more creatures like it could be lurking in other parts of the world, emerging from impenetrable shadows or dense underbrush just as silently and unexpectedly as it did that fateful day. Regardless of any ultimate conclusions, one fact remains clear. Life had thrown a curveball in my direction when I least suspected it during that otherwise normal hike through those seemingly peaceful woods. While I could never truly understand or predict the whims of fate, I knew with an unwavering conviction that I owed my continued existence to the courage and timely intervention of two fellow hikers heeding my desperate pleas for help. I stood in the doorway of my recently acquired cabin, taking in the isolation of the surrounding woods. My name is Eugene Kasprovich, and I came to escape the city's noise and chaos after my divorce. A few days into my stay, I learned about a group of missing persons who had rented a nearby cabin. Just like that time in Rextonford Grove, I mumbled, recalling a similar story told by a co-worker. One day, as I ventured deeper into the forest, I stumbled upon an abandoned campsite. Tattered clothes littered the ground, while traces of blood painted the scene with an ominous urgency. Feeling unsettled, I decided to return to my cabin. There, a neighbor named Matthew McElroy introduced himself over dinner. He mentioned stories about mysterious deaths and disappearances that have plagued these woods for decades. Blame it on old man Redding's farm, Matthew said with a chuckle. Rumor has it he created some kind of mutated beast that haunts these woods. Late at night, odd sounds shattered the silence. Rustling leaves, snapping twigs, and guttural growls filled the air. I dismiss them as coyotes or raccoons since stories about monstrous creatures are mostly fictional. On one stormy night, the noises grew closer and more sinister. Tensed up in my chair by the fireplace, gripping an old hunting rifle I purchased locally, it seemed like protection might be necessary. The eerie darkness suffocated me as yells broke through. It was your standard horror movie character Alec Duquesne in need of help. Pleading for assistance with bloodied hands pressed against my windowpane. It got Lorenza, he shouted in terror. You have to help me. Together through sheets of rain coming down fast over us, we hurried back towards Lorenza Austin's lifeless body sprawled nearby. Alec explained how some sort of creature attacked them while camping. We lugged Lorenza's body back to my cabin, where we tended to Alec's wounds. I recalled what Matthew said about the deaths and missing persons. A newfound terror weighed heavy upon me. What on earth? I muttered skeptically as I bolted the door shut. Matthew's crazy stories can't be real, right? Alec, looking pale with fatigue and fear agreed. 
Yeah, if it weren't for your help, I... His sentence cut short as the cabin shook with violent force like something rammed against it, the growling more threatening than before. As we stared horrifically out of the window, our hearts pounding in sync, we caught a fleeting glimpse of a hideous creature. Standing like a man, but covered in thick fur and fangs protruding from its elongated snout. There's no way that's what Matthew was babbling about, some mutated beast. Alec shouted. What do we do? I glanced at the hunting rifle and cursed under my breath. Maybe this will slow it down, if not. Well, it's better than nothing. I grabbed the rifle, checking to see if it was loaded, while Alec fumbled with the first aid kit, wrapping bandages tightly around his wounds. The creature outside seemed to circle the cabin, snarling and growling as it moved. I need to call for help, Alec muttered, reaching for his phone. Signal, I reminded him. Out here in the woods? Unlikely. He frowned and tried anyway, cursing when the call failed to connect. What do we do now? he asked. We need to get out of here somehow. Find a safe place or at least put some distance between us and that thing. I replied, trying to sound more confident than I felt. We waited until the sounds of the creature seemed farther away from the cabin. Then, as silently as we could manage, we slipped out through the back door and took off into the woods. Each snap of twig underfoot or rustle of leaves caused our heart rates to spike fearing that the creature would be upon us at any moment. Over time, our adrenaline-fueled energy began to dwindle. Alec's wounds were taking their toll on him. He was losing blood, and I could tell he was in pain despite his determination not to show it. We found a hiding spot within a thick cluster of bushes. It wasn't ideal, but considering our dire circumstances— we didn't have much choice as we needed some time to rest. As we sat there catching our breaths and trying not to make any noise, I formulated a plan. We head back to town once it's light enough for us to see properly. It's safer than stumbling around in the dark. Alec nodded his agreement, too exhausted to argue. The night ticked by slowly as we remained on high alert for any sign of the creature. We could occasionally hear distant growls echoing through the woods, but so far it didn't seem to find us. Finally, the first light of dawn filtered through the trees, and we knew it was time to move. Silently, bloodied and beaten, we pressed on towards civilization. As we walked, Alec recounted what had happened to him and Lorenza before they were attacked. They were camping at a nearby campground when the creature emerged from the forest, just like Matthew's stories. The creature moved swiftly and before they even could process what was happening, Lorenzo was torn apart. Alec barely escaped with his life. Our journey back to town was thankfully uneventful besides Alec nearly collapsing several times due to blood loss and exhaustion. It took hours for us to make it back to the safety of civilization. Upon our arrival, we immediately contacted the authorities about their encounter with the creature. An extensive search of the woods ensued, with animal trackers and expert hunters scouring the area. But as one day turned into two, then three, with no sign of any unknown creature or Lorenz's body ever found. Though encouraged by the dwindling presence of that menacing growl over time, we couldn't shake that sinking feeling in our gut that lingered on after each terrible night spent in anticipation. It felt like a nightmare with no end in sight, an enigma unpredictably morphing into reality right before our eyes. Following exhaustive questioning from investigators and more than a few skeptical looks from friends and acquaintances alike, they eventually categorized Lorenza as missing and concluded that he most probably fell victim to a horrific animal attack. Alec decided to move away from town soon after. Either of us could bear to live so close to that forest anymore. 
though most nights still left me startlingly awake at the slightest sound outside my window pane. I'd hear a distant whispered echo of what sounded all too eerily like that terrifying growl. It eventually faded into obscurity alongside quickened heartbeats. Part of me is glad the search didn't yield results, and yet I can never truly find peace knowing that the creature that killed Lorenza is still out there, lurking somewhere among the shadows. The memory of his lifeless body and that haunting creature serve as a chilling reminder that some mysteries are better left unsolved. However, no amount of unanswered questions will ever bring Lorenza back. But one thing is certain, we'll never forget him, and he'll always be in our thoughts. My name's Otis Meckler, and I can tell you I've seen strange things working as a cab driver for the last twenty years in Salton City, California. It's a dry, weary town. The desert stretches in an endless sea of sand and scrub. One day, I picked up a fair Wilbur Trask at a rundown motel. We exchanged pleasantries and shared a joke about potato chips. He said he was looking for his cousin Tilda Brennan who had gone missing weeks ago. His concern was palpable. Wilbur explained that Tilda had been working on a journalistic piece about odd happenings near the Salton Sea. Locals talked about mysterious disappearances and supposed sightings of an ungodly figure roaming around the abandoned Navy base in the area. Skeptic inside me scoffed, but my interest piqued. So after dropping him off, I decided to investigate on my own. The abandoned buildings were like skeletons rising from the earth. The setting sun cast eerie shadows over everything. As I walked through the dilapidated interior of one building, I sensed movement nearby and heard distant whispers fading quickly. A cold realization began to unfold within me. These people weren't just conjuring wild stories out of thin air. Maybe there was truth to their tales. Over the next few days, more and more reports surfaced about missing persons and gruesome finds at the abandoned base. Stains of dark reddish-brown marred walls and floors with no explanation or motive behind them. Slowly, fear was gripping the town. With each visit to the base... I'd notice fresh evidence of something monstrous stalking its victims without remorse or pity. My skin would crawl as I listened to stories of violence that defied understanding or reason, stories that wouldn't have been out of place in a twisted horror novel. In one horrifying instance, a decomposed corpse was found hanging from a tree, its limbs twisted into unnatural positions. The mere sight made even the most hardened investigators turn away in revulsion. Who or what could have caused such carnage? The locals suspected the creature they believed to be guilty of these terrible acts. They called it the reptilian beast. A grotesque, scaled thing with long limbs and glowing yellow eyes wandered ghost-like through the abandoned navy base. But even though these horrific descriptions came from multiple sources, no hard evidence could be found. I reached out to Wilbur, hoping our shared involvement might lead to valuable insight or a way of escaping this nightmare. Together, we ventured deep into the desolate remains of the base under substantial moonlight searching for any sign of this reptilian creature. As we entered a decaying naval building, we heard faint and unrelenting shuffling behind us. Though we thought it was just paranoia taking hold, it slowly became louder and more persistent. Besides, there seemed to be no way of keeping completely silent in the pitch-black entryway. We hesitated briefly but ultimately decided to face our fears and confront whatever was hunting down Salton City's citizens. As we rounded the corner, Previously unseen shadows coalesced into a horrifying figure that defied description. Scales seemed to glisten in the darkness atop jagged limbs curving out at improbable angles. 
I realized too late that it was everything I had heard about the reptilian beasts before us. Seizing an opportunity in our stunned silence, it lunged forward with blinding speed and an almost animalistic snarl, thirsty for blood and craving vengeance against those who dared defy its intentions. In that split second, I didn't think about fighting back or seeking answers. All I knew was that we needed to escape from the threat looming in front of us. Wilbur wasted no time, grabbing my arm and pulling me away from the reptilian beast as it lunged towards us. We raced through the dark, abandoned corridors of the naval base, with the sound of clawed footsteps echoing behind us. Help! I screamed at the top of my lungs, hoping someone might hear us in the desolate area. Wilbur and I weren't lucky enough phones with us. We hadn't prepared for an encounter like this. No one responded to our cries for help, so we kept running. As we sprinted down another corridor, I noticed the door ajar on our left leading to a room without any other exits. In there! Quick! I urged Wilbur. We slammed the door shut as we entered the room and started piling any objects we could find against it. Old metal desks, chairs and whatever else we found in the darkness to create a barricade. As we pushed against the final table with all our might... We heard bangs against the door as the enraged creature tried to force its way in. The banging grew louder and more desperate as time went by making it difficult to focus or plan. Wilbur frantically searched for anything that could be used as a weapon but came up empty-handed. I had hoped that maybe there was an emergency phone or walkie-talkie we could use to call for help, but of course, luck was not on our side. The banging continued but eventually slowed down until it stopped altogether. There was an eerie silence as Wilbur, and I exchanged nervous glances, hoping against hope that the reptilian beast had given up its pursuit. We remained completely still and silent for what felt like hours. Finally mustering up enough courage, I whispered, Wilbur, we have to get out of here. We can't just wait for that thing to come back or for someone to find us. We have to get as far away from this place as possible. With our hearts pounding in our chests, we hesitated before removing the makeshift blockade cautiously. The door creaked open, and we peered into the corridor. It was empty. We quickly made our way back through the base, retracing our steps to escape. With each step closer to the entrance of the base, fear not at me as I considered the horrific fates that past victims may have met at the hands of this sadistic creature. The reptilian beast's relentless pursuit and violent attacks added a sense of overwhelming dread and terror. It seemed driven by some mixture of vengeance and bloodlust that could not be quenched. We finally made it to the outer buildings and spotted our car in the distance. Running towards it, my legs felt like they would give out at any moment. As we drove away from the base with shaking hands and drained expressions, we realized we had survived something that previous victims hadn't. Wilbur and I never talked about what happened at the base again. Rumors continued in Salton City about the reptilian beast lurking in its depths, but neither of us dared venture back there or ask more questions than necessary about it. The reptilian beast could have been an alienish creature lost on Earth. It's a possibility now etched into my mind due to its incomprehensible existence. The thought sent shivers down my spine each time it crossed my mind. As life went on, Wilbur and I couldn't help but remember those who had vanished before us, those who weren't lucky enough to escape the horrifying beast that was stalking Salton City's citizens. However gruesome their end, they would live forever as chilling reminders in the corner of our minds.